Welcome um, to the uh, sessions P05. This is about leadership, um, um, political settlements and bureaucratic pockets of effectiveness and the role of technopoles. Um, I can see there's about 15 of you in the audience, which is great. Uh, I'm kind of trusting technology that you can hear me. Um, uh, you could stick a raised hand up if you wanted to, just to confirm you can hear us. Um, so this is a session that Sam has put together. I'm chairing the first one. Um, and there's another one this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, UK time. Um, Sam's going to give you more background into into the project, but it, essentially it's come out of a number of projects uh, coming out of Manchester from the ECID uh, Research Centre, uh, the Effective States and Inclusive Development Centre, uh, and another sort of related ESRC project on bureaucratic pockets of effectiveness. But in the context of of this conference, we are um, uh, looking at the role of technopoles and, and, and leadership within those pockets of effectiveness. Um, so we have four very excellent papers uh, lined up for this first session. We have one absentee uh, may join us, but we're somewhat doubtful. Um, so Sam's going to start with a quick introduction to some of the conceptual and, and uh, issues and empirical issues and methodological issues that underpin uh, our approach and the projects. A number of people have in this first session are all from, from that particular project. Um, and then we've got uh, Maya and Cesar, uh, followed by Matt Tice, followed by Abdul Ghaffaru, followed back by Sam Badru and Haggai. So uh, each speaker is going to have about uh, 12 minutes and then that should leave some time for Q&A at the end. Um, this is quite an interesting kind of technological issue. We're going to try. There's, there's, there's somebody in the background called Banner as well who's helping us. So between the three of us, we should be able to to to. Uh, do all of that so you've got if you've been in other sessions there's different ways of contacting us there's through the text chat you can raise a hand or you can pose a question and we can then uh, depending on how how much discussion we can either bring you up to the podium or we can simply post your question etc cetera, etc cetera. but during the presentations um, unfortunately you're kind of automatically muted so uh, even if you gasp and, and, and or cry out or scream uh, the speaker can't really hear what you're saying so um, there's not much feedback for the for the speaker you might want to clap a little bit in, in emojis if you want to um, but I'm going to first uh, turn to Sam who is going to give an overview of, of the kind of conceptual ideas underpinning this. So thanks Sam. Great thanks Charles and thanks everyone for coming along uh, to this session. Um, a bit of a first for most people I, I suspect presenting uh, presenting this way and perhaps attending so uh, uh, let's see how we go on this. It's the, certainly the first time I've given an academic presentation wearing, while wearing a pair of shorts. Um, the the project most of you will be quite familiar with um, on today's um, uh, topic um, around the role of pockets of effectiveness in delivering development. And what we've tried to do within uh, these two sessions, and particularly the first one, is draw on a growing body of work around um, pockets of effectiveness, high performing agencies in the global south, and put it into conversation with the conference themes on leadership looking both at the role of political leadership at the national level and organisational leadership of particular uh, public sector agencies. Um, so we're hoping to talk directly to the conference themes. The project itself comes out of a funded ESRC uh, Research Council project um, with further funding from the Effective States and Inclusive Development Research Centre, which has been based at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester uh, since 2011 and comes to a close uh, later this year. And all the resources, all the publications related to this project so far, there's many more forthcoming, uh, can be found via that website. Um, so the puzzle we're looking at is around uh, why public organisations perform relatively effectively in delivering on their mandate in conditions that are otherwise highly unfavourable um, to effective public service and delivery. This is a puzzle that has become increasingly um, renowned in international development, and um, particularly because people think it might offer clues as to how to improve the state's ca capacity to deliver development and inform a new um, governance agenda. Um, our, we, we, we're on board with that agenda, but we also take a very political approach to this. And when we looked back at the history of state building in 
the global north as well as the global south, it occurred to us that um, bureaucratic enclaves are always the ways in which modern states start to get built. Uh, with capacity developing first around the treasury or the revenue authority, often the military. Um, so we wanted to put it in historical context. Uh, we were also keen to move beyond uh, the discussion of pockets of effectiveness as being somehow islands cut adrift from a sea of patronage. Uh, and we actually thought there's something about pockets of effectiveness, which is around their discretionary nature. Um, that they get chosen by political leaders and get encouraged to use discretionary processes uh, that might link them to a politics of patronage as well as a politics of building civil service systems. And Merrilee Grindle's work uh, makes it clear that these two processes can go hand in hand for quite prolonged periods. So we're looking at POEs as windows onto these deeper processes of state building and political rule in sub-Saharan Africa. And we applied the ESID framework, which some of you will know about, uh, which seeks to examine how political settlements, uh, the underlying configuration of power in a given society, shapes government's capacity and commitment to deliver on development. So what we did was choose some countries which reflected different types of political settlements, dominant settings such as Rwanda and Uganda, uh, where uh, you might expect dominant coalitions to have a longer time frame and to invest in building institutions for the long term while also being wary of the capriciousness of dominant unaccountable leaders and then we chose three more competitive settings Ghana, Kenya and uh, Zambia uh, to explore the hypothesis that whilst democratic pressures could increase state performance they might also increase the incentives for political rulers to meddle uh, in their bureaucracies uh, for political gains. There is no international index of high performing agencies, so we had to identify these ourselves. So we did expert surveys in each of our countries and asked people which were the standout performers. And we came out with a remarkably similar set of agencies, traditional departments uh, within ministries of finance, budget departments usually, uh, revenue authorities as, as examples of semi-autonomous agencies and central banks as examples of autonomous agencies alongside a few other sort of one-off um, agencies uh, which we'll refer to during the presentation as we go along. So we had um, a lot of comparability here uh, that we'll seek to convey in the country presentations that are coming, minus unfortunately Rwanda. Um, we couldn't have Benjamin Chimuni with us today. Um, last slide before we go on to the first presentation from uh, Maya and Caesar. Um, there is no index of performance for any of these organisations, so it became difficult for us. We had to kind of invent these indexes and each of the country presentations will indicate how we see performance of uh, our agencies ebbing and flowing over time in relation to political dynamics. And these indexes, which we can field questions on later, were constructed using objective data where it was available, for example, with ministries of finance. Uh, we looked at proposed expenditures against um, actual um, um, levels of supplementary budgeting over time, as well as other international indexes. But we also did informed case studies of how such ministries responded to crises, whether economic or through political pressure. Central banks are a bit easier. We have good IMF data on the things that the, uh, the mandates that central banks have to keep prices stable over time in terms of inflation and to keep the banking sector stable over time with financial stability indicators. But we also looked at in-depth examples of bank closures to look at whether due process was observed and whether there was a politics around what, which banks got closed. And finally, with revenue authorities, we didn't take tax to GDP, uh, which doesn't allow for the structure of economies. We used the ta we used tax effort data, which builds in a sense of what you might expect a country to be able to collect and then you can start to look at what the policy regime and administrative effort actually delivers you. And our main interest was in administration. So we try to control for big policy shifts at given periods. OK, so we've done what we can to be as rigorous as possible um, and to take us through some of the case study evidence that we've got to um, having completed our work. And we're now in the first stages of putting together the country summaries. So this is the first time these have been presented and thought through, um, handing back to uh, Giles, or maybe straight to Mayor and Caesar. Up to you, Giles.
Okay, um, so yeah, I'm going to bring uh, Maya in now, um, who is from SIPA, and uh, she is uh, co-written this paper with uh, Cesar from Zypa, but she can tell you more about that. So I'm now going to bring um, Okay, here we go. Hi, Maya. Hi, how are you? Very good. I'm now going to load your PowerPoint. And then I will close myself off. So, yeah, welcome to Maya. Oh, and there is Cesar. <laughs> right. Okay, let me start the session. Uh, hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're all well and safe. Uh, this is from Lusaka. Um, this is myself, Maya Hinflaer. Uh, I'm a director of research in, of the South African Institute for Policy and Research. I've been in Zambia since the 1990s. And next to me is my colleague, uh, Cesar Cello. Say hi. Hi, uh, everybody. Cesar uh, here. Uh, Sam was talking about rigor. Cesar has kept the rigor in terms of uh, working with data. He's an economist by profession. Uh, I'm an historian uh, with an emphasis on uh, political history of, uh, of Zambia. So I'll do the presentation and Cesar will be available for questions, especially if they're pertaining more to the indicators or to the economic uh, side of it. Uh, so we're looking at a, a period of pocket of effectiveness in, in Zambia uh, and the technicals that played a role in that and then we'll briefly contrast that with what's going on in more recent years. So I think we can have the next slide. All right, this is the older slide. Okay, that's fine. Um, like uh, Sam said, we, we base our, um, you know, pocket of effectiveness um, periodization on the survey that we did with uh, people in the field. Uh, and then we also uh, brought in uh, some more objective indicators as well. Well, the survey showed, was done in a time when, when things went really downhill here. So it's quite tainted by being quite a negative perception overall of how Zambia is functioning, let alone the institutions. Um, so we keep that in mind. Uh, but the things that people highlighted was that despite of the problems, you know, the Ministry of Finance, Bank of Zambia, Zambia Revenue Authority, to some extent, we're still kind of holding out. Uh, and so we'll go a little bit into detail uh, on that. Next slide. So here we're looking at a period. So in Zambia from 1991, we became a multi-party democracy and we changed from a state-led economy to a highly liberal, uh, uh, liberalized uh, economy. Uh, so in the 1990s, uh, we saw structural adjustment uh, taking place and it was a very difficult uh, period economically, but also in terms of the social cost of that. Then in the 2000s, uh, we see a couple of changes. We see the Mwanawasa gets into power in 2001. And at that point, he has quite little policy space. He's still really operating within the framework of structural adjustment. Um, that changes really around 2005 when we uh, achieve, you know, we get the debt relief and also the copper prices uh, start to rise. Uh, so Zambia really gets a bit more fiscal space uh, at that point of time. And then you can really see that the Zambian technocrats come more to the fore uh, and start more with their own uh, programs, uh, which both play into the needs of the country, but also play into political survival because we have quite strong opposition parties in Zambia. Uh, so the people you see here on this picture is uh, Kalab Fundanga, who was the governor of the Bank of Zambia. Uh, the book was written by Maganda, who was the minister of finance. Uh, very crucial role was also the secretary to treasurer in the Ministry of Finance, uh, Musa Kotwana, who later became Minister of uh, Finance under Rupia Banda. Then we also had Berlin Masiska at, um, at the Zambia Revenue Authority. But crucially, I think they all linked really well to the president and state house. Uh, these were people who were chosen not on the political affiliation, but more on their uh, technical capacities. 
they knew each other. A lot of them came from the University of Zambia in the econ economics department in the 1980s. Uh, and also, um, they were closely linked to Moses Banda, who was at that time the economic advisor to Manawasa. So what they did was really come together, uh, formed like an economic committee uh, to be more aligned, uh, align the institutions to one another. Of course, you know, since we're having uh, economic problems at the moment, uh, there's a bit of glorification of the spirit of time and the people involved. Uh, of course, we have to be a little bit careful uh, with that. But overall, I think we, we can really point out that this era was quite, uh, uh, you know, a pocket of effectiveness. And it was sustained throughout the next period under Rupia Banda, and then it really went into decline afterwards. Maybe the next slide. Yeah, so here we took, we, all our papers on Ministry of Finance, Bank of Zambia, and Zambia Revenue Authority are all positions within uh, the political settlement framework. Uh, that's in Zambia competitive democracy. And like I mentioned, there was a technocratic consensus in the 2000s, and it was really aided by favorable economic conditions at the time, high copper prices, uh, and having no debt uh, anymore. That changed in 2011 when PF came into power. We're slowly getting more and more authoritarian uh, in character, and that has really had an imp impact on the technocrats. They're really feeling sidelined in, when it comes to uh, policy advice. Uh, and that goes for other groups as well, where civil society and other private associations, uh, sector associations, were involved in the 2000s, where they were consulted. It's very difficult now to reach government. Most of the policies are really executive driven from, from state house. We also have to note that this is happening in, the political parties here are quite weak. So there's a lot of shifts even within. So you can't say MMD was like 20 years was the same kind of policies because of the internal turnovers and because of the death of Monawasa, there's a lot of factionalism uh, which has also influenced policy making. And we've seen the same with PF when President Sasa died in 2014. That created a lot of tension between the party and affected policy making in those economic institutions. So we've seen increased authoritarian rule, but quite a weak basis. It remains quite vulnerable. We'll see next year with elections what will, will happen there. Next slide. So in terms of performance patterns, we can see that, you know, like I said, 1990s were really difficult. The mining companies got privatized by 2001 when the copper prices were very low and the conditions were very poor uh, in terms of uh, tax exemptions for, for the country. And that changes uh, later on. So from 2004 to 2014, Zambia grows to the extent it becomes a lower middle income country. And we also shift from a very high aid dependency in the 1990s to where uh, donors really contribute a very small uh, portion to uh, our budget and mostly is now do domestic revenue. In recent years, we see also an increase in the debt. So that is kind of part of our revenue, which is becoming more problematic. So as we mentioned before, that was sustained till 2011, then with uh, a change on, of regime, which came with a, a dose of uh, resource nationalism. We see an, a sustained or an improvement of Zambia Revenue Authority, but then a decline uh, after it becomes really, really politicized uh, institution. Uh, Bank of Zambia throughout remains largely autonomous, but of course it's difficult to function in this kind of environment or to be effective with your policies. If, if overall the economy is not functioning very well. The next slide. So you see some of these technopoles, you know, their, their names are still going around. Some of them, you find them in, um, in UPND, the opposition party, like Musa Patwana, uh, but then others also established a third force and they're kind of pushing back on the economic crisis that's happening. So they haven't really left the public uh, arena uh, of Zambia. Next one. 
So some of the key takeaways across is that clearly those technopoles were very important, but they were effective because they had a good relationship and the support of, of State House. I think that's quite uh, crucial. Um, at the same time, in 2008, when Manawasa died, they found it quite difficult to sustain uh, that technocratic uh, consensus, but they, they held on for some time. So we can say political settlement really matters in the case of Zambia. Uh, that pockets effectively can work under competitive democracy in the ways that Sam explained. Uh, but yeah, it was difficult to sustain after 2011. And like I mentioned, the, the inter-party struggle and well, also the internal party factionalism uh, really undermines performance to a large extent, not helped by you know uh, the kind of emphasis on executive uh, influence on uh, on policy making that can work out positive in the case of Manawasa that works out quite negatively under Lungu. And of course, while copper is not the dominant uh, revenue stream in Zambia, it's, it's still a very large one and that still poses structural constraints on our economy. And then the last slide. Uh, as I mentioned that, you know, this the idea of having technocrats more back in, in position is, is a popular notion uh, at the moment after a high level of politics and, and, and cadres within the system. Uh, of course, we're also looking like what's, the, what's going to be the next generation of technopoles. Um, you know, do we see a shift in norms where, where the politicization becomes a norm or do, can we see a return to this kind of more technocratic era? And of course, we keep in mind that you know it's not a solution in itself if if nothing happens uh, at the top. Next slide. Is there a next slide. I wanted to make one point about uh, transnational influences and ideas. Like I said, there was a decrease of influence of donors, which gave space to the to the Zambian uh, technocrats to to take their own roots, that had two consequences. I think it was a positive one because it really strengthened that group of people. Of course, they still operated within a more like neoliberal economic order. But what was lost with the, with the donors leaving uh, the scene was that they at times also uh, gave uh, political insulation um, to some of the ministers. Uh, so they acted sometimes as an in-between, which was very useful. So it's it's a kind of uh, not a single uh, conclusion on, on the decline of, of the donor influence in Zambia. Is there a last slide? I think we're there. Yeah, so that was the presentation from the Zambian side. The Ministry of Finance paper has been uh, published already online and the Bank of Zambia and Zambia Revenue Authority are, I think, coming out probably next month. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, thanks, Maya. That was, I was checking, that was the last slide as far as I could make out. So, <laughs> Sorry, but thanks, Maya. thanks for sticking to time. It's a great start. Um, I'm not going to preempt my questions or the discussion because uh, knowing the Ghana case well, there's some interesting parallels there. So um, unless anybody's running out to another session and needs to ask Maya and Cesar a question now, I'm not going to take any questions. Uh, we'll have Q&A at the end. So I'm now going to move uh, Maya back to the audience and I will bring up uh, Matt Tice. So one second, bear with me. Hello. I am just loading your PowerPoint. Great. Can you hear me okay? Because I, I struggled a little bit to hear the last presentation. Okay. Um, it's a rainy day in Manchester. Uh, seems to be interfering with the Wi-Fi. The right presentation? Yep, yep, that's the one. I, um, yeah. Um, welcome to Matt, who is uh, at Manchester, is a postgraduate postdoctoral fellow um, who's been working with the ECID project for some time. Uh, as you can see, we'll be focusing on Kenya. So I'm now going to depodiumize myself and uh, let that. Lovely. Thanks, Giles. Um, so yeah, pre presenting on Kenya and 
uh, kind of uh, similar findings to to Myra in a way about the kind of uh, uh, the, the the kind of implications of a competitive political settlement. Um, so, if I could move to the next slide. <laughs> Am I being heard? Uh, yeah, can I move next slide? Ah, great. Um, so I just thought I'd quickly, uh, Sam kind of mentioned we did expert surveys uh, and I just thought I'd quickly include the results of mine just to show that Kenya kind of to some extent conforms with the, the kind of economic technocracy performing strongly. Um, on the left, you see a graph of kind of uh, nominations of, of organizations that are high performing according to the survey in Central Bank of Kenya and Kenya Revenue Authority. Um, came top uh, in terms of high performers. Uh, where Kenya kind of differed a little bit from the other cases is that the, the Ministry of Finance or the National Treasury, as it's called in Kenya, uh, was actually identified as a kind of uh, a declining performer, an organization whose performance had significantly declined uh, just in, in the period prior to the survey. I mean, it, it probably partly received a lot of nominations just because I conducted the survey at a point where it had just been implicated uh, in, in, in kind of a string of corruption scandals. So um, I, I'm sure responses to some extent were shaped by that, but uh, performance indicators also kind of uh, corroborated to some degree that there was uh, some kind of declining performance. Um, so if I could move to the next slide. Uh, oh, I didn't know if there was a problem with Giles we're hearing. Um, the, the performance periods, as Sam said, we kind of used a, a range of performance indicators. Uh, and when you put the performance indicators for those three organizations together, you come up with three, uh, for Kenya, come up with three kind of broad performance periods. Uh, I'm not going to go through each of them in detail, but you kind of had a, a first period in the 1990s that had a, a variable set of outcomes. There was only kind of price stability. Uh, that was consistently strong performing. All the other indicators were kind of variable or poor. Uh, similar to Zambia in the, in the 2000s, you have this kind of improved period of performance, um, but particularly strong outcomes um, up to 2006. I mean, thereafter, some of the indicators dip off or tail off slightly, particularly in terms of the deficit, um, revenue collections, uh, the momentum in that slows after 2006. Uh, and then this kind of 2013 period onwards uh, of potentially worsening uh, outcomes, except for kind of price stability, which has remained constant uh, largely throughout. Uh, and I'm going to focus just on that second performance period rather than go through all of them and, and kind of explore why the 2000s, that 2002 to 2013 period was was one of improved and certainly more consistent outcomes. Uh, so we're going to move to the next slide. Uh, I mean, just to preempt uh, some comments that sometimes come, I mean, it's some, sometimes pointed out that there's kind of uh, a clear kind of exogenous explanation there, um, that there was, it was just a kind of relatively benign period in the global economy. Um, and, and the, well, a large number of our cases did experience kind of better performance uh, on their indicators in that period. Uh, and you could also say, that to some extent the dip in performance from around 2006 might have been related to and, and certainly was related to some degree to kind of more difficult conditions um, the global financial crisis in 2008 but also Kenya's own uh, domestic election related violence in that year um, which uh, yeah kind of for sure uh, has a role uh, Michael Chege has written a recent paper saying that Clearly, these factors are important, uh, but they can also be overstated. I mean, Kenya, unlike Zambia that we just heard that benefited from copper prices, uh, isn't uh, a natural resource or a kind of extractive resource exporter, not yet anyway. Um, and has also actually never received any kind of external debt relief uh, in contrast to, to other cases. Um, and so Gane, Michael Chege kind of says that while Kenyans are rightly held to account for the deplorable performance in the 1990s. There's also a, an argument that they deserve credit for when the performance improved. Uh, and I'm going to try and explore that kind of uh, domestic imp uh, uh, improvement in performance. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, and I find uh, kind of part of ESID's conceptual framework is, is a strong emphasis on ideas and 
I find quite an important role for ideas, and particularly in this period, uh, which is very much linked to the presidency of Mike Ibaki, um, who shared a common set of ideas with this kind of inner circle of kind of politi uh, politicians and te technocrats or kind of uh, technopoles, as I'll, as, as I'll explore on the next slide. Uh, and a lot of them uh, would, were educated in the West, uh, often in economics, um, and had worked at Western donor organizations. So they kind of were receptive to international policy ideas, but also had a critical engagement with them uh, and selectively kind of adopted them. And Rado Upadhyaya um, has written about the Central Bank of Kenya and its kind of selective approach to engaging with international banking regulations. And she kind of finds this selective approach. And I've found it more broadly throughout the economic technocracy during this period. Um, I th if you were to kind of distill some of the key ideas that bound President Kibaki with his inner circle of technopoles, I mean, there was a particular emphasis on sovereignty or regaining sovereignty uh, after the kind of humili humiliating, perceived humiliating conditionalities of the previous period under Moy. Uh, and, and a particular route to achieving sovereignty was to fund the, uh, the budget domestically. And the Kenya Revenue Authority kind of adopted this tagline of setting the country free um, through raising ta taxation, funding the budget domestically. There was also an emphasis on fiscal discipline, there were ideas around fiscal discipline, but there was also um, kind of a pushing back on the very rigid donor interpretations of fiscal discipline. Uh, and that was kind of uh, in terms of fiscal policy, there was a pushing back on on demands for austerity and budgetary surpluses. Uh, there was more a kind of agreement that there was an acceptable uh, deficit level that would allow a significant public investment program in education, in health, in infrastructure. Um, so it was a, a similarly uh, in kind of monetary policy, there was a pushing back on rigid inflation targeting as well, um, which starved in uh, from speaking to people at a central bank they, there was a perception that this kind of rigid emphasis on inflation targeting had starved the private sector of credit and so this was an attempt to increase credit to the private sector increase financial inclusion whilst also kind of maintaining some sense of fiscal discipline and then finally there was also uh, a keen interest amongst Kibaki and his inner circle on ideas around new public management and there were widespread experiments with this and performance management tools across government um, but they particularly took root in in uh, in the three case studies which uh go on to now if we can move to the next slide um which yes kind of talks about organizational leadership and kind of the role of like-minded technopoles who kibaki uh, appointed at cbk central bank kra kenya revenue authority and the national treasury uh, three organizations that he saw as being critical to his developmental vision um, and he had a tendency uh, and has been criticized for his tendency to appoint kind of childhood friends to these positions or business associates uh, and certainly that kind of fed uh, accusations that there was an ethnic bias to Kibaki's administration and that had a I mean a significant kind of perception issue as the 2008 uh, to, uh, that, that kind of fed into the 2008 electoral crisis. But at the same time, there was a significant level of trust um, that Kibaki gave to these organizational leaders that gave them a lot of discretion and autonomy, and particularly or that kind of included autonomy from donors as well. Um, Maya kind of talks about that kind of policy space, and um, Kibaki was willing to give his, his kind of technopoles a significant amount of space, uh, to push back against some elements of those donor orthodoxy that I uh, explained before. Uh, and so you, uh, uh, Sam and, and Tom Lavers have written about this kind of process of ideational fit where technical polls kind of play a key role um, in translating donor and technocrat policy ideas into, into kind of policies that are palatable to political elites. Um, but in this kind of period, it almost operated in reverse. Uh, where Kipaki and his inner circle had very clear ideas, didn't need to be convinced of the merits of particular economic policies because they were economists. And so technopoles in this period almost had a, the flip side of that process of showing how the policy ideas of Kibaki and, and his inner circle fitted broadly with a neoliberal 
agenda. And, and that was a quote from a former CBK governor, um, said he had spent a lot of time kind of reassuring the IMF that it was that they were pursuing the same outcomes. It was just a different way of getting there. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, I mean, so far, I kind of explained why, perhaps why the, the, I feel the outcomes were, were improved during this period, but also, as I, when I showed the kind of performance patterns, also explained that there was this kind of dip in performance from around 2006. Uh, and I think to kind of bring in the political settlement analysis now, uh, it's just, it's, it's a reflection on the difficulty of protecting and sustaining pockets of effectiveness within competitive or dispersed political settlements. Um, in 2005, Mike Gilaki's kind of broader ruling coalition collapsed. Uh, the, the, the next year, somewhat related to that, there was a major scandal called the Anglo, Anglo leasing scandal, which is a political financing uh, scandal that really tainted the legitimacy of the government, just as the 2007 elections uh, were approaching. That kind of triggered or, or played a part in, in triggering the election violence of 2007-8 and thereafter there uh, uh, seem to have lost my uh, um, yeah a fragmented unity government from 2008 for the remainder of Kibaki's second term uh, and uh, tomorrow there'll be a presentation from Tim Kelso and Nikolai Schultz on a kind of new political settlement typology and their typology, which looks at the kind of social foundation of a political settlement, might suggest that Kenya even transition to a wholly new political settlement um, from 2008, within which it's been harder to centralize rent seeking uh, and to protect the ec economic technocracy. Um, and so you, during kind of this kind of post 2006 period, you see a uh, Kibaki and his inner circle are less able to maintain kind of exclusive control over the economic technocracy that affects the treasury the most. Um, just it's more susceptible to political pressures because by nature it's led by politicians um, and had marked instability in its leadership post 2006. I mean, to the degree that Kibaki had to almost, according to various informants I spoke to, step in as the as essentially as the finance minister himself. Uh, so you, that explains some of the dip in the Treasury's performance. KRA overall remained a pocket of effectiveness, but was kind of hobbled by a very dysfunctional tax policy environment, part of which was explained by the instability at the Treasury, which uh, struggled to design and push through Parliament significant new tax legislation. Um, and CBK, I mean, kind of remained more insulated from this, uh, both for its kind of formal autonomy. I mean, it's, uh, its legislation just gives it a far higher degree of independence, but also the kind of continued presence there of a technopole who, who, who kind of managed to fend off any kind of political pressures that the central bank did start to face. But yeah, just this kind of post 2006 period was just a, a period in which after an initial kind of positive um, positive direction, Kibaki's inner circle struggled to maintain some kind of coherency within uh, the economic technocracy. Uh, and so if I could just move to the to the last slide, uh, just to conclude, um, I, I mean, to, to echo Maya and, and, and Michael Roll as well, that, I mean, essentially, uh, the underlying political economy or as we look at the kind of political settlement in which the organization is placed is is kind of bound to overcome and dominate the other causal factors not exclusively um and and also he said kind of the emphasis on transnational political settlements is important here and uh, kind of this distinct forms of disciplinary neoliberalism uh that, that kind of pushes these organizations to undertake functions that are, uh, are valued by a neoliberal state building agenda, particularly around kind of inflation targeting or, or deficit targeting. Um, but equally that, that there's kind of also a, a positive perhaps role for these kind of transnational factors in kind of mitigating Kenya's uh, political business cycle somewhat. Um, but also, I mean, having said that these kind of structures of power associated with a political settlement are important, there is also significant room within those structures of power uh, for organizational leaders and reformers to move um, and kind of to echo, echo Merrilee Grindle and, and David Leonard, that there's a good deal of room still for human agency within that. 
So I think that's me done. Uh, fairly horrific. I'm not going to explain my why. <laughs> yeah, Wi-Fi problems. Um, okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, no that was really good. Um, I'm now going to, we have, um, the next speaker is going to be a video um, from Abdul Ghaffar. We've tried to raise him via text and email, but can't. Um, so he's prepared a, about 15 minute uh, video, which we will attempt to display. So I'm going to uh, knock Matt out. Also wanted just to welcome um, new arrivals to the session. It's great that you're here. Uh, I also forgot to mention, which I think you should have been informed about, but um, the session is being recorded, um, which uh, just for the record. So I'm now going to attempt to load a video. So bear with me. OK, uh, thanks very much, conference organizers. I am Abdul Ghaffar Abdullahi from the University of Ghana, presenting on the Ghana case study as part of ESSIG's um, comparative project into the politics of effective public sector agencies in developing um, countries. And I'm presenting this in collaboration with Jas Mohan from um, Open University. Um, although Ghana has been widely celebrated as uh, a democratic success story in Africa, several data sources suggest that the Ghanaian public bureaucracy is not as effective. Um, if you take a look at the world governance indicators, for example, uh, you would see that in the, in the last decade, Ghana's average score on government effectiveness has just been around 52%. And our own expert survey uh, uh, findings presented in the pie chart here suggest that at best Ghana, is an average performer when it comes to the capacity of the state bureaucracy. In other words, uh, even though effectiveness is not a norm, Ghana is not a poor performer either. And one can find um, specific pockets within the public sector where you can, where organizations are able to perform their mandated function um, quite well. The POEs we've been studying in this project are the Minister of Finance, the Bank of Ghana, and the Ghana Revenue Authority. But in this presentation, I want to focus on uh, the Finance Ministry and the Central Bank's uh, case studies to show how political settlement dynamics have historically shaped the, the performance of these two key public sector agencies, but also to demonstrate how the performance of these agencies has been mediated by other factors and here we make a particular case for the important role that technopoles can play in shaping organizational performance. In terms of methods, we adopted a qualitative historical approach um, going back to the early post-colonial period in the 1950s. One key factor that makes Ghana a particularly suitable case study for this project is, is the fact that it has experienced different political settlement dynamics or trajectories in its post-colonial history, um, shifting from competitive clientelism in the early post-colonial period to a vulnerable authoritarian um, settlement uh, for a long period of time, then to a dominant leader type of settlement in the 1980s and back to competitive clientelism from the early 1950s um, till date. And this kind of history presents us with an opportunity to explore the relationship between political settlement types on the one hand and organizational performance on the other. We measured the performance of our case study organizations using a wide range of indicators. In, but here I'll just focus on um, trends in economic growth, inflation control, control of, uh, of, of, of budget deficits, as well as the extent of the central um, bank's financing of the government's budget deficit. There are three key things that I would like like us to take notice in this particular um, graph. The first key observation is the fact that Ghana has experienced a very stable um, uh, pattern of economic growth since the early 1980s. Secondly, you would see that growth has been highly erratic, varying from negative growth rates in the 1970s 
to a peak of around 11 point, uh, 11 point, uh, 14, around 14% 14 in 2011 when um, um, commercial oil production actually commenced. The third key observation is the fact that you can see significant variations in the rates of growth across different political settlement types, with the worst performance being recorded during the vulnerable authoritarian regimes of the 1960s to 1981. And then things began to pick up quite significantly um, from the early 1980s, and growth has been quite stable, fairly stable, uh, since then. Inflation control is also a, a shared responsibility between the Minister of Finance and, and, the, and um, the Central Bank. And here on this indicator, again, you would see substantial variations in, in, in the annual inflation rate. Again, with the worst performance being recorded during the vulnerable authoritarian regimes of, of, of the 70s. But there's one key other important thing that I would like us to take notice in this particular um, graph, which is that you would see that both the worst and the best performance in terms of the annual inflation rate occurred during the vulnerable authoritarian um, regime of General Achampong from the late 1960s to um, uh, at the mid 1970s, and we'll come back to explain what actually happened um, to, to, to bring about this kind of varied results during this period. One area where the finance ministry hasn't done really well is in relation to controlling the budget deficits. And you would see here in particular that uh, the, the, the performance of the ministry has been subject to some form of political business cycle in the sense that the budget deficits have been particularly very high in election years, uh, which are represented in this graph uh, by the blue bar graphs that we are seeing here. The only notable exception here was in 2004 when the budget deficit as a percentage of GDP was just around 3.2% compared to nearly 15% in 2008 and about 12% in 2012. Our research findings show very clearly that uh, an important factor that played that, 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 that contributed to this performance was the nature of leadership within the Ministry of Finance. This graph, I mean, paints a picture that tells us very clearly that the performance of the central bank has also been subject to some form of political business cycle, particularly with regards to um, the Bank of Ghana's uh, financing of government budget deficits. In 2002, a new Bank of Ghana law was passed and capped um, government borrowing uh, from within the domestic banking system to around to 10% of the previous year's tax revenue. What we are seeing in this graph very clearly is that in every, in literally every election year, this um, cap is often exceeded substantially. And it is only election years that this actually happens. And, and the worst of this actually occurred in 2008, as we can see, when central bank financing of the budget deficit amounted to about 39% of the previous year's tax expenditure. As revenue, rather. Um, just in case I, I, I run out of time, I would like to give a brief summary of the main findings of this of this of this of this project. Um, first, we have I mean, we are arguing that the nature of the political settlement, particularly along the dominant competitive clientelist axis, is important in, in, in shaping organizational performance. Employees are particularly more likely to emerge and endure under and, uh, and dominant political settlements than in countries characterized by competitive. Clientelism. However, the impact of the political settlement is not deterministic in the sense that organizational performance is still mediated by several other factors, including the role, uh, the nature of leadership, the degree of bureaucratic autonomy, and so on and so forth. Uh, thirdly, we think technopoles, or we find that technopoles as organizational heads can play a particularly important role in boosting organizational performance, and we'll come back to explain why. And the final key finding is that the degree of cohesion of factionalism within government coalitions can have significant implications and on organizational uh, performance. So let me just pick these findings one after the other and see um, what summaries I can, I, can, I can make of them. 
And first and foremost, we find that right from independence, political settlement dynamics have played very important roles in shaping the performance of both the finance ministry and the Bank of, 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 of Ghana. And we can, we can get back to um, as far back to the, um, to the first post-colonial regime under Nkrumah. We know Ghana inherited a very healthy economy and was able to maintain macroeconomic stability for a short while, due in part to um, the existence of leaders within the finance ministry and the central bank who were able to restrain Nkrumah's um, patterns of public um, spending. But as the regime became increasingly vulnerable, particularly to um, powerful excluded elite factions, Nkrumah began to ignore technocratic advice and actually eventually fell out and more or less eventually forced the resignation of his finance minister and close political ally and friend Tom Bedema, but also his chief economic advisor in the person of W.A. Atta Louise. And the regime also took several um, steps to weaken the, the autonomy of the, central, of, of the central bank, including the passage of a new Bank of Ghana Act in 1963, all of which paved way for monetary indiscipline, particularly in the form of excessive central bank borrowing um, by, by the government, which pushed inflation to new heights. Under the various vulnerable authoritarian settlements in, this, in the late, from the late 60s to 1981, macroeconomic stability actually got worsened for them. I mean, due to several reasons, including a uh, weakened um, autonomy by, 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 by leadership within both the central bank and the finance ministry, as well as the, the unstable nature of leadership um, due, due to the rapid changeover in, 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 in military regimes during this period. The dominant the dominant settlement under the PNDC ruling coalition was actually able to restore macroeconomic stability in part because it was insulated from important socio-political veto groups that allowed the regime to do a lot more than previous, uh, previously more constrained regimes would actually do. It appointed very competent and autonomous leaders that received political protection from the head of state directly. But with the return to competitive clientelism in the early 1990s, we began to witness the resurgence of political business cycles, inflationary pressures, weakened bureaucratic autonomy, uh, I mean, rapid turnover of ministers, governors, and deputy ministers, as well as uh, various key uh, technocrats within these agencies, all of which have had adverse implications on their performance. Our second finding relates to the relative importance or capacity of technopoles in, in boosting organizational performance for several reasons. One just key, one being that they are actually more effective in, in, in engaging in what Michael Roll refers to as political management. They are much more likely to, to allow a significant degree of, 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 of bureaucratic autonomy, which is actually important in shaping how organizations uh, perform. And, and, and this argument is illustrated in our project by several case studies. But here we'll try to see whether we can use the cases. I mean, one, uh, the case of um, Governor Jonathan Frimpong Ansa in the late 60s to the 70s and the leadership of um, um, Finance Minister Osafu Mafo in the, in the 2000s to, to, to illustrate this kind, of, this kind of argument that we are advancing here. Governor Frimpong Ansa was the governor who was actually able to keep, to keep inflation at very low levels in the late 60s to the early 1970s. Um, and he did it purely from the perspective of the kind of political management skills that he had. He was able to negotiate directly with the head of state and convince the head of state that his political survival depended partly on the autonomy of the central bank. And this kind of resulted in the form of a self-imposed fiscal discipline within the governing coalition, all of which contributed to keeping inflation very low at just around 15%. And shortly after his exit, we saw very clearly that inflation quickly jumped to more than 50% in 1976, and within a year, more than doubled to around 117% in 1977, partly because the successor of governor, um, uh, from Paul Ansa, in the person of Governor Emon Nikwe, adopted a purely technocratic approach. He seemed to have lacked the political management skills that his predecessor had, and, 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 and on several occasions kind of um, clashed publicly with the head of state. His advice was ignored by the regime, and he was eventually forced to resign in a way that helped turn the Bank of Ghana into a kind of a government printing press. We can make the same type of argument under the leadership of Honorable Osafu Mafo in the, in the, in the, in the early 2000s. Um, he's, he's a very known leading key member of the, of the New Patriotic Party. 
and as Minister of Finance introduced several new cash and commitment control systems and was able to actually keep expenditure patterns within budget ceilings. And if you look at the data, you will see that even the level of spending within the presidency was, was, was generally within uh, budget ceilings around that moment. He refused to pursue lax fiscal policies ahead of elections. Uh, and, 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 and all of this actually um, um, showed very clearly an improvement in a whole lot of macroeconomic indicators around the period, including patterns of economic growth, the level of budget deficits, and so on. The final key point that we are making, our argument we are advancing in this in this in, the, in this study based on our findings, is that the degree of cohesion or factionalism within ruling coalitions can lead to appointment patterns that, are, that I mean that can potentially undermine organizational performance. And we illustrate this in, I mean, with several examples, uh, again, going as far back to the Nkrumah era and the nature of his relationship between him and his first finance minister, Kamala Bedema, who, who was eventually forced to go into exile because of the differences that he, he had with, with Nkrumah as a result of his continuous efforts in trying to to keep Nkrumah's um, expenditure patterns in check. The same story can be told of the relationship between Jair Rawlings and Kwesi Bwete, his finance minister of the 1980s, who he protected quite significantly, but who he no longer I mean, saw the need to protect in the, in the 1990s because Rawlings now saw Chikata, um, Kwesi Bwete to be very tough as a result of differences between him and um, other key actors within the ruling coalition. The same kind of argument can be advanced um, in terms of the relationship between Osaf Mafo and President Kufo, who eventually got resettled out after the finance ministry, due in part, I mean, according to our findings, um, to internal party factionalism um, as the party was actually preparing for his next presidential um, primary. So these are the key findings that we are, we are reporting in this study, and I think I would like to leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... I don't think we have Abdul has joined us yet. No. Um, so without more ado, I will turn to our final paper for this session, uh, which is Sam Badru and Haggai. Um, I think I understand Sam will be presenting, but I did spot both Badru and Haggai are here, which is great. Um, just let me load the presentation. And welcome Sam back. Um, I will absent myself. Thanks, Charles. I'll just, I think I can move the uh, slides along, but it's only going very slowly. Okay, getting towards Uganda. Ha, okay. So, yes, um, so I've been involved with this country study with Badru and Haggai. Um, Badru was involved in the study of the Ministry of Finance and led the study on the National Water and Sewage Corporation. And Haggai accompanied me on the uh, Bank of Uganda study. Um, it felt too technically difficult to keep chopping and changing, uh, but Badru and Haggai will be there to help with specific questions uh, uh, later. Uh, so the survey that Badru and I carried out uh, on Uganda indicated something that had been pretty clear over the last two decades of, of undertaking research in Uganda. Um, the, oh, there was a handful of high performing public sector organisations which were very publicly visible and stood above the norm of public sector performance in Uganda. And it's really that experience which led us to put this, this project um, together. Um, and so we generated through the survey, a, a sample of uh, finance ministry, the Bank of Uganda, their top right, URA and the National Water and Sewage Corporation there as the key um, agencies to investigate. Um, what became clear really early on uh, was the extent to which the leaders of these organisations were highly prominent in public life in Uganda and had been over the last couple of decades in some instances. And what was also striking about the Uganda case is that the people you see here, top left, are the permanent secretary um, uh, since the late 2000s of the Ministry of Finance, uh, the central bank governor um, since 2001 and previous permanent secretary of the Ministry of Finance, top right. Um, bottom left, URA um, lead for nine years um, and Mahari, um, 
uh, the uh, last but one leader of National Water and Sewage Corporation, um, since replaced by Sylvan Magusha. Um, and these, none of these people are elected. Um, and this helps tell us something quite a lot about the nature of political rule and the types of relationships which Museveni has forged uh, in Uganda to maintain himself in power and to deliver on development. Um, highly personalised relationships between himself and a set of technocrats, most of whom managed to stay in power for quite significant lengths of time until a much more recent stormy period. Um, but they occupy very visible lives in public, uh, visible roles in public life in Uganda. There's likely to be a front page splash about these characters as any elected minister, and in some cases, um, more popular celebrity figures. Um, what we'll do when we go through the different agencies is track them onto the, the changing nature of Uganda's political settlements. And there's two main phases here. Uh, when Museveni and the NRM come into power um, in the mid 1980s, uh, they establish a largely inclusive ruling coalition backed by increasingly strong military rule, which establishes stability. And Museveni enters into a series of deals uh, between himself, leading bureaucrats and donors um, around an agreement to protect certain elements of the economic technocracy from political pressure. And this is particularly around the Ministry of Finance, joint with planning and the central bank, and they become critical to Uganda's success in delivering macro stability, economic growth, which is largely pro-poor um, for the first couple of decades. Um, this starts to shift from the um, early 2000s, um, when Museveni indicates that he actually won't hand over power to um, those behind him in the NRM in the 2001 election. You have elites leaving the NRM and forming a credible opposition. And over time, um, given Museveni's somewhat personalised populist approach to governance and to distribution of resources, you see increasing demands from below within the NRM coalition, which are increasingly hard to resist. Um, so that long-term vision uh, that's associated with dominance in the early period and some investments in capacity building, albeit limited, start to weigh in, uh, in favour of a more personalised form of populism that undermines rules-based governance. You see this pattern very clearly with the Ministry of Finance here. Um, Badru and I tracked its performance, looking in particular at the... Um, and you have the appointment of long-term and highly politically loyal and highly committed leadership to the Ministry of Finance both at the ministerial level and in terms of the permanent secretary. And we track the periods of appointment and they become much more extended from the early 90s onwards at both the political and technical levels. So you have a very strong performance uh, there, um, or strong organisational culture, people feeling as though they were doing the work of transforming state society relations from our interviews. And this starts to shift from the 2001 elections onwards. The Permanent Secretary, uh, Emmanuel Tumasimi Mutabili, who you've just seen, is fired, apparently because the um, president uh, was annoyed with his restrictions around public expenditures linked to elections. Um, and he's sent, he's a very powerful bureaucrat by then, and he's sent to be governor of the central bank, so we'll come back to Mutabili. Uh, and you find growing levels of financial indiscipline um, over the 2000s. Um, with supplementary budgeting um, operating at twice the legal limits and a period of complete capture around the 2011 elections where huge supplementary budgets go to state house for electioneering um, purposes. There's some attempts by the Ministry of Finance to recover as the passage of a Public Financial Management Act in 2015, but within that is a deal to massively increase the expenditures which state house would get anyway, so there's no real need for supplementary budgeting there. So it's recovery within political capture. The Bank of Uganda, which is, and we're looking at price stability here, inflation, the green line there, um, benefits from the first, the moments we've already discussed of the imposition of financial discipline. The president is committed to keeping inflation down because he sees it as fomenting not just economic, but also political instability. And that, along with the granting of autonomy to the central bank in 1993, sees rapidly improved performance, um, led by strong governors from the mid-1990s mid onwards. 
Um, and you see the similar collapse around the 2011 elections, not just because of financial indiscipline from Ministry of Finance, but also because the governor is prevailed upon to um, issue old treasury bills um, to enable the national resin, uh, resistance movement to effectively buy the 2011 elections. But you see a quite rapid recovery um, by the governor um, to protect the ministry at the sorry the, the central bank around the 2016 elections you don't see similar problems there and I'll come back to that. The central bank's record on financial stability the red line there it takes a lot longer to gain capacity in this area partly because of the nature of the banking sector and its slower development partly because it's just a tougher thing to do uh, to monitor and manage um, banks uh, than it is to have a strong monetary committee around inflation. Um, but again, you find strong performance in line with the uh, strong leadership and stable political settlements. Um, but you find strong deterioration towards the end of the 2000s and particularly th since 2010, uh, where you see a dip in financial stability indicators and three highly controversial bank closures linked to the, the political ownership of those banks, uh, the president's fear of um, domestic capital, um, gaining uh, to uh, dominance a, a role in ways that might challenge him and also factionalism within the World Bank linked to the politics of ethno uh, regional balancing uh, which means that a, a very ill governor gets kept in position despite not being capable of, of, of offering the oversight required for the central bank and that's yet to recover in terms of uh, the banking supervision function. And finally, in terms of the economic technocracy, the Uganda Revenue Authority is a bit different. The president is arguably not as committed here. We do see an, a, a bounce in the early and mid 1990s um, with uh, semi autonomous status for the Uganda Revenue Authority. But you see that dip straight away from the 97 and 2001 elections where the president um, uh, go, goes lax on tax policy. Uh, we do see a recovery in the mid 2000s, largely because of the appointment of a very strong technopole, um, Alan Kagina, who was able to turn things around. And then when she, towards the end of her reign uh, and under the uh, previous recently fired um, Commissioner General, we, do, we don't find much um, strong uh, performance uh, at all there in the latest phase. I'll come back to URA in a second. But finally, Badru's case study of the National Water and Sewage Corporation is interesting. So here we're on the dotted line, which um, again, you find strong performance under the dominant period with much less presidential involvement. Um, Museveni does select, have a role in selecting the leaders, but this is really a case of organizational leadership leading to turnaround of this public utility. Uh, dramatically improved performance with um, donor support in the uh, mid to late um, 2000s, partly by resisting privatization um, here is part of the uh, success story. So it's not all about new public management and privatisation here, as, as the story often for POEs. Um, once prominence is gained for the National Water and Sewage Corporation, presidential protection is leveraged by the organisational leaders to protect it. And in a fascinating interview that Badu and I undertook, the leader of the current leader of NWSC told us about the 80-20 rule where you have to allow the politicians 20% of your time and energy resources, maybe the odd appointment, but you protect the 80% around of production and performance by doing that. Um, and that, but that requires presidential protection and a great deal of effort to manage the politics. Um, and so what we can see here uh, um, with um, uh, NWC performance more recently is that it hasn't dipped as much as others despite increased vulnerability in the political settlement dynamics. And this is because there's a synergy between delivering on highly public um, goods such as water. You see around election campaigns, um, staff donning the yellow T-shirts of the NRM and the president um, installing, going along to new installations uh, of water. But these have been heavily tilted towards the politically loyal Western regions and the pace of delivery is exceeding the capacity to provide high quality performance here. So but the general patterns overall here are much stronger performance under dominant developmentalism, much more uneven performance since the political settlements has shifted. Um, that's pretty clear with this revenue authority data on the black line there. And what's interesting here is that um, the performance where we had Alan Kagina as the director of the uh, Uganda Revenue Authority, Commissioner General, 
And she only manages to, to hold back the decline temporarily in the mid 2000s. Um, it's not for any prolonged period of tax efforts. And this is because of the shifting political settlement dynamics and the undermining of um, uh, organizational performance. So technopoles really matter. Um, the URA leadership has had to be politically connected and technically strong. We've only had that twice with uh, URA in the early period and the mid 2000 period, and only once in the early period did that coincide with favorable political settlement dynamics. And so you get a sense of the number of things that all need to be aligned uh, for organizational performance to actually carry through to delivery. So um, these technopoles matter. They can sometimes hold the line against um, uh, political capture. Um, uh, Mutabili held the line in the 20 2016 elections via a media campaign. But increasingly, you get the sense that these generation of technopoles have become part of the political decay that we've seen uh, within Uganda. So very briefly, um, to finish and to talk to all of the cases that have been presented today and to some extent Rwanda, I would argue that when it comes to leadership, um, technopoles are essential. You don't get high levels of organisational performance without them being in place, but they're clearly not enough um, to uh, guarantee performance. Leadership at the political level is more significant, and for both types of leaders, we need to locate their performance within uh, the broader political and the political economy conditions and configurations of power within which they manoeuvre and which constrains that room for manoeuvre. Um, political settlements trump all. Dominance can help, but is highly capricious over time. And competitive factional pressures make it really difficult for organisations to perform well. This can be offset, as we saw with Zambia and Kenya, um, by high level coalitions of technocrats and politicians acting together within favourable broader structural conditions. It's a really di a difficult balancing act uh, in more competitive conditions. International support is critical. We didn't identify any high performing agencies that hadn't benefited from international support, but we often found this support to be problematic around policy tussles that Matt pointed out in Kenya, but also much more broadly that the investment in capacity building by donors has been heavily neoliberal in nature. Those parts of the state to benefit have been those that have been in charge with ensuring that African states are good citizens of the global neoliberal order around preserving macro stability, jumping through various PIFA hoops. And they haven't been the ones that have been there to challenge that, to promote structural transformation and engage in more productivist elements of industrial um, policy. So it's really skewed the nature of the state and the types of development strategies that um, African countries have been able to promote in the last three decades. So implications are that we need a much more balanced approach to building capacity um, beyond the economic sectors and beyond a particular ideological approach. Uh, we also find that um, pockets of effectiveness can help, um, but they're clearly no silver bullets. We don't find much evidence of positive spillovers, only really in the case of Rwanda, which we can discuss in Q&A uh, if you like, but they can also be used as weapons of um, political uh, oppression um, as well, as, as we saw with the Zambia Revenue Authority. So I'll stop there. We can come to other policy implications um, if people want to take the discussion uh, in that direction. Thanks, Giles. Uh, thank you, Sam, uh, and thanks to all the speakers. I'm going to, I think we can get four people up here. Um, obviously, I still don't see Abdul has joined us, so I will get have Maya back and... Okay, so um, I I will do my best as well to uh, answer questions directed at Abdul Bufari, who is not here, but we were co-authors of the paper. So um, I was aware there was some text chat, and I missed. Sorry, my um, one of my 
I kept going dipping it out on Wi-Fi, so I think it cleared out people's questions before I could post them. So we have uh, a question from Nikolai. Um, I will publish that. So you should all be able to see Nikolai's question is, do leaders know whether they appoint a technopol rather than a kleptopol? Or is it mostly by luck that we see technopoles, uh, especially uh, when in competitive client context? And I also am seeing a raised hand tire so if we could address there's Nikolai okay Nikolai is happy for me to just read and post it I will publish again so does anybody want to have a go at uh, Nikolai's question um, I guess obviously especially in uh, competitive client context so Sam yeah, that's a great question. I'm sure uh, others will have something to say about it. I think sometimes definitely um, they know that they're appointing someone they can work with who are politically loyal as well as technically competent. Um, sometimes it's people they've, in the Ugandan case, that they're familiar with from struggles, um, um, not necessarily in the guerrilla warfare, but in the early stages of forming a government. Uh, for example, the, one of the ministers of finance was certainly trusted. He, he, he was known to be very anti-Abote, having lost his partner to Abote. Uh, so we had someone very politically loyal there. And it affects decision making um, around um, replacements as well. Um, so there's been a hiatus in the appointing of the governor of the central bank because the president wasn't sure um, he could fully trust um, the deputy governor to be, um, do the right thing politically, to know how to bend around when he, the president really needed something to happen and when the technical line could be bent enough for that to allow the politics to be manoeuvred. So I think it, I think it really does matter for more strategic minded um, presidents. Um, um, I like the term kleptopole. And I do wonder about technical. We, we, we've borrowed technopole from the Latin American studies and it, um, I wonder if some of our people are actually patropoles, that they're, they're experts at playing patronage politics as well as delivery. Mm -hmm. they, and they sometimes get heavily involved. These are not people with necessarily with the cleanest hands. Um, leading bureaucrats in Kampala have been responsible for rapidly increasing property prices in some parts of the city. Um, how they can afford those houses still remains a mystery beyond um, not being as technically minded as you might otherwise think. But they've also played a role that's kept the economy going. So they're, they're, they're very much in the mix. So I think we might need to play around a bit more with the phrasing. But yeah, great question, Nikolai. Yeah, maybe I can say something on Zambia. Um, yeah. right. I think the appointment is also very heavily influenced by signaling the international markets. Yeah. So in that sense, you need to have an overlap of um, of those the president can work with, but also who are acceptable to uh, international financial institutions uh, or private sector. Uh, and so I think in the Bank of Zambia, you see a bit of continuity because even the latest appointment is quite an independent person, a very unexpected appointment. Uh, but clearly that one is comes in as a technical, but uh, unusually so, you don't see it in the other economics to institutions. So I think there it's really kind of maintaining relationships uh, with international markets is very important. Yeah, I'll, should I, were you finished Maya? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, come into that point because I mean that period I talked about with Kibaki and he almost had a very similar profile of a technopole that he would appoint. They, they, they seem to kind of match with this background with in kind of yeah with the with the donors had some kind of experience with them and were able to navigate those relationships but also spent time at kind of research institutes within Africa who who kind of had an experience of tailoring kind of western econ economics to, to kind of the uh, Kenyan context um and and Kibaki was also yeah I mean he 
this was something he was criticized for for appointing his kind of childhood friends or business associates and um but it 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 did mean he kind of there was a, a level of trust there and a level of discretion that they had um but also yeah i mean i spoke to one of these technopoles and to come back with this kind of patropole thing they are i think Ibaki realized uh the need to have candidates who could navigate that particularly in a a climate that is kind of as as turbulent as as Kenya's political settlement um and one of them said to me that yeah you're kind of always navigating these murky gray areas um and i think Kibaki kind of realized the importance of that and and always kind of appointed people with the credentials but also yeah the, the who were able who were very deeply embedded in kind of powerful political networks as well okay um Matthias, do you want me to bring you up? Can you hear me? Hi, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Great panel, really, really enjoyed it. And I tried to type in my question, but for some reason it it restrains the, the, the space. I'm wondering, I mean, a question for all I all of you I had is, um, I mean, you, you look at you look at pockets of effectiveness primarily by looking at their performance, such as tax efforts and, and so on. And I think that's important. But what about, but but you could say, what about the actual characteristics or the actual workings of those agencies? And here I'm concerned, for example, about the salaries that were paid at particularly well, at, what, at pockets of effectiveness or the particular educational background of the public servants employed at those agencies, or the, more informally, the prestige that comes with, I don't know, holding a job at the National Water and Sewage Corporation, as opposed to the Ministry of Education in Uganda. So maybe you, yeah, if you hold a job at the former, you're considered one of the cool boys, yeah, whereas um, if you're in the Ministry of Education, that's seen as, mm, yeah, he's anyway just connected to somebody else who pulled him into that job. So I was wondering whether the, you also look why you didn't look at those indicators of pocket of effectiveness. And then for the Zamia case, I mean, I found it striking and super interesting. Um, so did I get just to clarify, did I get it right that you have a transition from democracy towards a more authoritarian regime? But at the same time, the underlying political settlement is competitive and weak. Yeah, is that so? Um, I mean, yeah, I'm asking. So is the so the settlement seems to be constant, but there is a change in political regime. Did I did I get this right? And anyway, I don't want to take up too much time, but I I have tons of questions for for Sam on Uganda. But maybe um, I don't know. I can hold off, and 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 if we still have time at the end, then um, I can return to that. Thank you. But I really enjoyed the panel. Um, I'm easy. Does someone else want to start? So yeah, I'm back. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah. Do you, Matt? Do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the question about the kind of inner workings, um, I mean, we, or, well, I did, and I think the project did look at those factors, but not as indicators of performance, but kind of explanatory factors is more how I understood those. I mean, all, all three of those organisations, to some degree, have kind of higher salaries than the rest of the civil service, less so the National Treasury, um, but Central Bank and KRA certainly have. Um, they've experimented most extensively with kind of performance management tools, um, bonuses to incentivize performance, um, and, and particularly under these technopoles in the Kibaki period, built this kind of I don't know, broader sense of organizational mystique, uh, which I think Merrilee Grendel has kind of talked about, or an organizational mission. So certainly looked at them, but not, not such as indicators of effectiveness, but kind of the drivers of, of effectiveness, I guess. Um, and I mean, but also as a, as in some way a hindrance, the salaries wasn't the higher level salaries in Kenya has actually become a bit of a blockage for for kind of new talent because people cling on to those jobs. They don't move to the rest of the civil service. Um, that there was this kind of perception that there's the old guard 
in the top positions, um, kind of blocking new talent from coming in. So it's, it's, it's also not to see it as a necessarily a, uh, an, a, an example of effectiveness, um, but also, yeah, did, did look at it. Yeah. Uh, just on that, I guess Mayor's got two questions to do as well. If you deal with that same one and then uh, make them go on. Um, yeah, like as with Matt, that's how, that's how we looked at it. On salaries, there's sometimes a negative spillover. So it was essential to attracting the best staff, but you can see it then can undermine um, other elements of the civil service. After the 2016 elections, URA got, all got paid their high level bonus um, the year after, but teachers didn't get their uh, bump uh, in salaries and so on. So there's an issue there. The efforts to create prestige and mystique were certainly there, um, particularly within the central banks, I think we looked at, um, and they were referred to as the bureaucratic aristocracy um, in Uganda. And what's interesting is that whereas that can sometimes, when it's aligned to a sense of national mission, as it was within URA and the Ministry of Finance at certain historical periods, the fact that the central bank is more autonomous than the others and doesn't have the same level of political leadership which gives it protection, but also removes it, if you like, from that broader, um, almost patriotic push, has meant that they've remained somewhat separate. And when you when you talk to central bank staff about what drives them, they people rarely discuss the national interest um, or patriotism. It's about the amazing healthcare they get, uh, the fact that they can travel anywhere, the education they get for themselves, and and so on. Um, so all those efforts to build up organisational prestige, if delinked from a broader project, can have um, damaging effects, we, th we found. Uh, Maya Cesar? Sure, and uh, just to add on the aspect of uh, the um, organisational aspects, um, I think partly the project um, sort of had two tires in terms of we, we, we did have a perspective on, um, like everybody has said, on salaries, on training requirements, on on um, prestige and things like that. And yes, they were important uh, influences, but I think like has been said, uh, they weren't used so much as indicators, maybe because um, we uh, they are so determined by uh, sort of internal uh, in-country specificities. Whereas we, uh, at the project level, so also for comparability, I think the indicators that were chosen were chosen in the interest of being able to compare across countries and across institutions in terms of objective indicators. But um, in the Zambian case, I think it was very clear that um, that um, uh, those those elements did play a, a particularly strong role. Uh, things like prestige of working at uh, a ministry of finance as opposed to working in any other ministry. Uh, the training requirements, I think also the legal uh, constraints that protect the institutions that Sam hinted on were important factors. Um, uh, not anyone can be appointed to, say, central bank governor. You need certain uh, qualifications, and that's important. And, and um, in sort of insulating the institution to attract uh, sort of technicals of one uh, caliber or another. Um, yeah, I think those those aspects um, maybe you were lost in translation in terms of the emphasis here, but I think to various degrees they have been sort of looked at um, quite a bit across the different institutions that we looked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then concerning the questions about uh, authoritarianism, I think here we're hinting at uh, the change, especially from 2015 to 2011 already, we see, uh, you know, there's less tolerance for opposition. PF is more like a vanguard uh, party that has consequences. But then when uh, uh, SATA dies in office in 2014, we had a presidential by-election in 2015. Uh, which uh, President Lungu kind of barely won, uh, and that led to really preparing for the general election 2016 by closing opposition newspapers, uh, by playing around with constitutions, uh, with the constitution, 
there was a very uneven playing field in 2016. And even now, it's very difficult as an opposition uh, to have space. But at the same time, we also have to realize that, you know, it doesn't have the army to play around with to enforce uh, its position. So in that sense, it's uh, it's weak and it's also lost a lot of its constituencies. So it's, that's why we call it a weak uh, system at the moment. And it's very difficult to predict. It's very fluid of, of where that's going to end up. But it's, it's, it doesn't really help uh, the institutions uh, at the moment. Okay, I've got a, a question from Joseph which I am going to publish and it should be there for a good couple of minutes now. I think I've changed the settings. So um, yeah, leading on from that, quite interesting. Did Technopoles tend to bring their own senior staff members to help carry out their ideas or did they typically work with the senior bu bureaucrats already at their agencies? Um, I mean, I think uh, talking of the Ghana case, I, I certainly think that one of the problems we we see there was that there's a big churning of senior bureaucrats that during regime changes, uh, which has always undermined the ability of of um, those technocrats to see through their plans and visions. Really, it's been it's been a, a, a really regular a problem, and I guess Joseph, you've you've come across that yourself um, in in your own work in Ghana. But um, I'll turn Matt again. Do you want to? Speak to that? Uh, I mean, yes, this, I guess it depends which of the organizations. I, I think the Treasury, there was more of a tendency to, yeah, for these kind of technopoles to bring in their own their own people, I think, because it's e easier to turf out the, the ones who are already there. Um, to some degree as well with KRA, which is more easily influenced and it's to some degree like an appendage of, of the Treasury. Um, CBK is much harder to move people on. And, and so you don't see that same kind of churn that, that Giles talks about. Um, and actually was a an issue that was a, there's a, a degree of political management internally in trying to shift people around um, to just try and free up a, a bit of space. But it was um, governors, successive governors have struggled to move on. People are quite keen to hold on to the uh, well remunerated and kind of uh, valuable position and have kind of political networks of their own that they can use to to stay in position i think for zambia it's, it's a very similar situation i think it uh, varies by institution uh for the bank of zambia or the central bank um the churning there's, there's been very little um quite a lot of stability there uh, not not much turnover but when you turn to uh, the finance ministry, as well as the revenue authority, uh, you see quite a lot of turnover. And um, actually, in relation to the question, it doesn't seem to be only uh, localized to the technopole coming in. Um, but um, I think it extends beyond uh, the way the appointments are done of uh, say, permanent secretaries or directors and the turnover uh, seems to go somewhat beyond just uh, the technopoles who uh, hold the, the top positions and are supposed to be bringing in the senior staff. Uh, so there's a dynamic there, I think, that could be pursued and understood a little bit more. Uh, but uh, I think like Kenya, um, there are sort of two parallels to that. There's, there's one side where um, there's not much turnover, and then there's the other sides where there's quite a bit of churning that you see with regime shifts and even within the regime um, when it is seen that um, certain um, senior staff are not uh, working well uh, with the technopoles or with the uh, system as it were, uh, the turnover continues even with the regime. Okay, uh, Sam, is it, uh, I was just going to bring, get off and bring um, Badger up. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, for the case of national water, <clears throat> I think uh, um, uh, when the new leader was uh, appointed, I think the first thing that they, they had to do was actually to, um, uh, to, to reduce on the number of staff, not actually bringing in new people. So um, I just wanted to comment on, on the fact that uh, um, 
uh, for national water to, um, to perform better, the new leader had to um, uh, to reduce on the staff numbers because the organization was uh, said to be overstaffed. And so, um, yeah, so they did bring in uh, a, a new recruitment until, um, until after uh, around six years, that's when they started uh, uh, recruiting new uh, new uh, uh, members of staff after reducing around 50% of the original staff uh, numbers. Also, um, the question around the salaries and the uh, status of working in national water. Um, <laughs> by the time the turnaround for national water happened, uh, was actually shameful to be working with the uh, with that uh, organization because it was known to be harboring uh, corrupt uh, government officials and uh, um, you know, it was uh, quite inefficient and so uh, it, it, um, uh, the salaries were uh, very low so uh, it was quite a, a, a difficult time it was not until um, things um, you know turned for the better that people have started uh, feeling uh, proud of, of working with uh, National Water and Sewerage Corporation. I think those are the two issues that I wanted to comment about. Thank you. Yeah, just on some of the other Uganda um, cases, um, the um, it varies a lot. There seems to be critical junctures, Joseph, um, where it becomes possible to have quite big shifts uh, then um, increasingly difficult to change people over time. Leading technopoles spend a great deal of energy making sure they have godfathers and sometimes godmothers amongst the political elites who can protect them um, and make it very difficult for them to be removed, not just because of their technical expertise, but because of the political relationships that they have. Um, so uh, factionalism at the higher, higher level um, has a quite a big inf influence over how long you're able to, to hold that post uh, together, but um, great that we now have Abdul Ghaffari with us, who's that, who's been dealing with an emergency his side in Accra. Um, your 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 work was presented earlier, AG. Um, I'm not sure if you can see Joseph's question or not um, on technopoles uh, and uh, whether that whether senior technopoles bring in their own teams when they're appointed um, to their positions, or do they typically work with senior bureaucrats already? <laughs> agencies from, uh, from the Ghana story. <clears throat> Thanks very much and sorry for um, um, joining late due to some emergency at heart and um, have to be out of the house um, since morning. And so I, I think with regards to that issue, the, the, if, if you take a look at the finance ministry case, one clear example of that um, has to do with um, Honorable Osafu Mafo in the in the in the in the two thousands, when he 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 was minister of finance for quite some time, and partly as a result of some internal party factional issues and so on, he got reshuffled out of the finance ministry to the Ministry of Education, and one of the first things that he did was to actually. Uh, identify a couple of people that he thought he had worked with so well within the finance ministry and took them out of the Ministry of Finance and carried them to the Ministry of of of, of, of Education, um, which, which which generated some some controversies and and and, and so on. So occasionally, you, you 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 we did see evidence of that type of thing where technopoles would carry away certain bureaucrats that they thought they could work fairly well with um to 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 to, to certain new places that they had been they had been careful um to and and and, and i mean one of the cases that that wasn't included in 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 the presentation is the ghana revenue uh authority uh story um when and and you you we, we also saw evidence a little bit of evidence on that with regards to um, um, Mr. Labi, who had been the um, the senior the the the, the, the senior uh, main person bureaucrat leader 
pushing through the various um, reforms and who took people away from certain uh, um, um, revenue agencies when the newly um, revenue um, secretariat was, was was created to help coordinate the entire revenue uh, sector. He also took away certain people from the internal revenue service to, uh, to form part of the national revenue secretariat that was created in 19. Um, 86. So th th there is some evidence of that with regards to the specific Ghana uh, case studies that we look at. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Abdul, and great that you could uh, get get here in person. Um, we, we did show you a video, uh, which is great, and thanks for that. Um, I'm conscious of time, and um, there's lots of things happening in the next hour over lunch, or a little bit more, various displays, and then there's a keynote, I think, coming up around two-ish. Um, so there was a few off, a uh, few conversations in the in the chat, which was good. Uh, you can contact any individual speaker that you like. Um, but I'd just like to thank all the speakers. Uh, thanks, Sam, for putting this together. Thank the audience, although we you can hear us, but we can't hear you. But that was great, and that was a good session. We're coming back. I said 4 o'clock. I think it's 4.15. So there'll be more papers in this panel. So please do try and come back um, then, even if it's a little bit late in the day, if you're ahead of us in the time. But yeah, can I just thank the speakers? I think we can clap each other. Uh, and uh, enjoy your networking lunch and grab whatever food you wish. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Now, uh, the, 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 this paper tries to interrogate the existence of pockets uh, of effectiveness in the, the selected public services in Nigeria. It is generally averred that public service delivery is the face of governance anywhere in the world. Uh, so Hello, good evening, everyone. Copano 2015, Brasio 2015, all of these, uh, they reaffirm uh, this very uh, statement. Now, what this suggests that if, if, you, if you say, uh, Service delivery is the face of governance. That means that. Hello, Prof. Can you hear me? I can't hear anyone. You can hear me. Where, they, where, where the people have access to quality and quantitative uh, uh, services uh, being delivered uh, by the government, and that these services are delivered in the most effective way. That is the only way uh, and time where uh, governance makes actually makes sense to the people. Uh, therefore, the assertion that citizens, uh, in fact, that government is ineffective. If they cannot have access to basic uh, public services, if citizens have to uh, uh, provide services that government will ordinary, uh, ordinarily supposed to provide for the citizens, if citizens have to pay or give bribes before they can have access to certain uh, uh, basic public services, then uh, uh, citizens uh, consider such government ineffective. At, at the extreme end, citizens confirm uh, we 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 we. we assume that such a government is, is non-existent. So while there is a general negative perception uh, actually to of, of the effect, effect of the ineffectiveness of um, of uh, public service delivery across most African countries, uh, the, 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 this paper seeks to interrogate the case of Nigeria and rather whether even in the midst of all of these uh, generalization, whether there are at least some areas where uh, we can uh, get uh, effectiveness in public service delivery in Nigeria. This is important because majority of Nigerians continue to lack quality and effective public services uh, from the government, even as uh, it's, it's, it's the case also in most parts of uh, the continent. The effectiveness of government in delivering these services uh, for this study were measured through citizens' experiences of these services of services like reliable electricity, uh, safe uh, uh, safe drinking water, uh, healthcare management, uh, road and bridges construction, among others. Uh, so, on this basis, uh, the paper interrogate the existence or otherwise of some uh, level of effectiveness in this uh, in this uh, service uh, service delivery. Now, citizens are used uh, to to gauge this because, of course, we know that citizens are. Uh, are the direct uh, beneficiaries, the direct consumers of, uh, of these goods. This paper is built on the theoretical or on the participatory performance monitoring framework uh, as, as developed by the World Bank in 2004. 
Now, this framework, uh, as conceptualized by framework, entails a practice wherein citizens uh, and, and citizen groups are, are allowed to evaluate the implementation of government uh, policies and the performance of such policies in terms of when it has to do with uh, public services. Uh, this is done using certain indicators uh, which citizens are allowed to rate uh, on how, uh, how well they feel that government is performing uh, in those areas, in delivering public service or in implementing certain uh, public uh, services. Now, it involves the participatory performance monetary framework involves that ordinary citizens, that the local people, uh, the, the local people will monitor the performance of public projects and service delivery. It threatens the contribution of the ordinary citizen in governance. This framework allows citizens to be part and parcel of the government by, uh, by, by, by serving as kind of a watchdog by, uh, by evaluating the services being provided by the government. It is on the basis of this framework, the participatory um, uh, performance monetary framework, that this paper is built. And we, from using this framework, we uh, set out to appraise the effectiveness of public service delivery in Nigeria through citizens' evaluation. Now, this is very important because as the PPM, the, the participatory performance monitor adopted for this study is um, uh, that uh, the research design uh, adopted uh, is the descriptive uh, research design. Data for this study were uh, part, 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 specifically uh, gotten from uh, the Afro barometer data uh, base, an online database where uh, these data are stored. So the, the, the methodology adopted for that data collection was uh, the descriptive research design and the, the, the method was a quantitative uh, method. The study population were from, uh, drawn from the Nigeria, uh, Nigerian populace uh, who were 18 years and above and the research instrument was a structured uh, survey. Now the sample technique and the size, uh, the sample technique adopted for the study was a clustered, stratified, multi-stage and probability uh, sample, that is the uh, simple random uh, sampling. Uh, and then the sample size adopted was uh, 1,600 uh, sample size uh, was adopted for this uh, study. Uh, now the data uh, were analyzed using the descriptive uh, statistics uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, SPSS. Now, uh, we, 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 this study showed that um, among the 10 public service delivery that were uh, measured set to be tested for this study, uh, we found that uh, among the 10, uh, as, as generally uh, averred, uh, six of them showed that uh, showed a very low level of uh, government performance, and so uh, we consider them to be uh, to the government to be ineffective in that area. It is it is uh, it is pertinent to state at this point that citizens were asked to rate the government on how best they perform uh, in delivering these services, whether uh, fairly well or whether uh, badly or very badly or fairly badly, and, and etc. And they were rated. Uh, using a like scale. Now, the 10 uh, the public services that this study gauged were managing the economy, government uh, improving of living standard of the poor, uh, job creation, keeping prices stable, reducing crime, improving pub basic public services, addressing educational needs, uh, uh, providing water and sanitation services, maintaining roads and bridges, providing reliable and providing uh, reliable electricity. Now, we are not oblivion of the fact that these are not, uh, of course, the, the entirety of public uh, service delivery. These are not exclusively it. But we understand uh, the, the, the choice for these 10 that were uh, carefully selected uh, is based on the fact that uh, without these 10, we consider that these 10 are very important uh, for the daily life of citizens. Otherwise, uh, life will be brutish, nasty and short. For, 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 for citizens if these uh, basic services are not available. And so we found that um, among the 10, among the 10 of these, uh, uh, among the 10, we found uh, reducing crime to be a uh, government to be effective in that aspect. We found that uh, improving basic aid services, government uh, is, uh, we found pockets, some pockets of effectiveness there. Uh, in terms of addressing educational needs, we found some pockets of uh, effectiveness there. And then in terms of maintaining roads and bridges, we found some level of effectiveness there. However, uh, in terms of managing the economy, uh, it is 
it is largely ineffective in terms of improving the living standard of the poor, the same ineffective uh, in terms of job creation, uh, ineffective in terms of keeping uh, prices stable. We found that it will be ineffective too. And in terms of providing water and sanitation services, uh, government was ineffective too. Then, uh, uh, lastly, uh, in terms of providing uh, reliable electricity supply, we also found that uh, the government is in perspective, uh, I mean, sorry, ineffective in those areas. Now, this uh, paper has a part on the search for uh, pockets of effectiveness in the largely ineffective uh, public service delivery system in Nigeria. We conclude that despite uh, the largely ineffective state of public service delivery in the country, uh, there are still few pockets of ineffectiveness. However, uh, the point must be made and very clearly too that there is need uh, there, there, there's need for more work to be done to improve uh, if on the effectiveness of public service delivery uh, in, in the country. Uh, I would like to uh, briefly, before I leave, to quickly appreciate uh, the, the Development Studies Association uh, for this opportunity to participate in, in this year's edition of, of, of the conference and uh, also for the, 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 waiver, uh, the registration waiver granted to enable me to uh, be a part of this year's uh, edition. I, I want to sincerely appreciate uh, the association for that. I also like to acknowledge Afrobarometer, a Pan African research uh, network of national public attitude surveys uh, on democracy, governance, economic conditions, and related issues in Africa. Uh, the, the data for the study we're getting from uh, the database, and I like to appreciate them uh, for that. At this point, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Thank you, God bless. Okay, let's um, go to our third and final um, presentation from Samin uh, Ali. Um, Samin, you are actually with us. Okay, Samin, over to you. I'll be presenting on effectiveness in Pakistani Punjab. Um, now, we know that bureaucratic capacity and performance varies immensely even within low capacity states. Uh, one of the explanations for this is uh, pockets of effectiveness. However, in this paper, I'm looking at a less formalized explanation, um, which is sometimes referred to as networks or channels of effectiveness. Next slide. Um, what the reason I'm doing that is because what I observed in my fieldwork was that there were no structural or sustainable changes necessarily to improving efficiency or capacity in departments, but instead what politicians would do would, was that they would appoint particular bureaucrats in particular posts at particular times in order to improve efficiency and capacity such that it served a political end uh, eventually. Um, next slide. So. Um, what I'm trying to do here is figure out one, how networks of effectiveness develop. Um, secondly, what do we mean when we, when we speak of bureaucratic performance and how these ideas are linked using politicized bureaucratic appointments and the role of political leadership on the one hand and bureau the bureaucracy on the other in the, in the Pakistani context. So let me just briefly discuss the literature. Um, we know that there's a lot of work on state capacity and in the 80s, uh, a lot of it was very closely linked to state autonomy and state, uh, to bureaucratic autonomy and bureaucratic capacity. Um, I'd like to make two quick points here. The first is that state capacity is as much about inducing behaviors in people or actors outside the state as it is about inducing certain behaviors by the amongst actors within the state. So, you know, yes, state capacity is about whether or not you can get your citizens to pay taxes, but it's also about whether you can get the bureaucrat to perform certain tasks and certain duties in certain ways. Secondly, uh, bureaucratic autonomy need not be independent of political interests. So it's possible that a political uh, appointee is getting a certain leeway or autonomy to do their job precisely because they are serving particular kinds of political interests. And this must be borne in mind. Um, now we know uh, from the literature that politicization can and does target the work of bureaucracies. There's a lot of work on this on presidential systems in the US and Latin America, for example. A lot of it uses the principal agent approach, uh, which has actually been criticized for being too rigid to explaining, to be able to explain the different relationships between politicians and bureaucrats. And so I use a patron client lens to understand these kinds of relationships because it gives me a little bit more flexibility. Um, it's important to remember that what I'm arguing here is that the key appointment in terms of enhancing performance and capacity is not a ministerial appointment. It's not a political appointment. It's a bureaucratic appointment. So appointing the right bureaucrat to the right post at the right time is going to improve efficiency and capacity, even if it's just a temporary fix. Um, 
So what I'm what I'm arguing in a nutshell is that patronage, patronage relationships between politicians and bureaucrats on the basis of work and professional relationships for work and professional ties, school ties, training networks are used to make particular appointments using legal and extra legal methods. Um, I'm not talking about illegal appointments in, 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 this, in this argument and I'll explain why at the end of this presentation. Next slide. So let me just uh, briefly give you the Pakistani context. So post-colonial country with a parliamentary system, so very similar to the UK and India. Uh, Punjab is its most prosperous and politically important province and between 2008 and 2018 where this paper is focused, it was ruled by the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz. Um, and this party has a history of forming patronage relationships with the bureaucracy that dates back to the late 1980s and 1990s. And you can trace uh, relationships that they had in this period, 2008 to 2018, with bureaucrats back to the 1990s. Um, when I refer to the bureaucracy, I'm referring to what is known as the Pakistan Administrative Service, which is an elite cadre uh, of federal bureaucrats, very similar to the Indian uh, Administrative Service. They are recruited through an examination, an examination only. There is no lateral entry. There is no private entry. Uh, this is, therefore, a very closely knit cohort, uh, which looks out for each other, socializes, is trained together, lives in compounds together. So it's a very closely knit group. Uh, next slide. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through the different forms of appointments that are used by politicians to, to, to enhance efficiency. So legal appointments are useful when you don't want to attract too much negative attention and you still want to get the task done, particularly when it's a high profile project that, for example, a politician has made a political commitment to in public. Um, so uh, these are particularly important, for example, where donor funds are involved. And the example I'm going to give you is, is a donor fund pro funded project known as the Punjab Education Sector Reform Program, which was funded by DFID. So this took many years to develop and eventually there was quite a bit of money uh, that was being given to the department to improve um, on a variety of metrics, including uh, the meritocratic, uh, meritocratic appointment of teachers. So teachers are typically political appointees and there's a lot of political interference in their appointments in Pakistan. So this was one of the major reform efforts at the time. So in order to uh, actually design the program, the department needed someone who could work with donors who had experience with donors and who had experience with the education sector and the design of policies of this nature. So they actually hired someone, they hired a bureaucrat and appointed a bureaucrat who was actually very good for the job. He was a former school teacher, he had experience with um, donor organizations working on education. And so he came in and he served for uh, one of the longest tenures in this department. Um, and you can see the, the, the image on the slide that he served for about nearly four years, which is almost unheard of in, in terms of tenure length in, in, this, uh, in, in, in Punjab bureaucracy. Um, however, once the program had been designed and had to be implemented, the requirements of the Secretary of the School Education Department changed. So now you needed someone who was not necessarily someone not necessarily you know, fully experienced in education policy or were donors, but someone who could actually implement the program. And so the government at that time brought in someone a secretary who had considerable experience with resisting political pressure. This was important because in the implement implementation of meritocratic teacher appointments, you had to be able to say no to politicians, even if they were governing party politicians. And so they brought in a new secretary and he also served for about four years, again, unheard of, even though there was considerable political pressure um, you know, for, for people who wanted to make appointments and whom he had been resisting. Um, next slide. So if you look at extra legal appointments, what do I mean by that? I mean um, appointments that are made uh, without breaking the rules, but by just pending them. So, you know, for example, if someone isn't reaching quite the seniority that you want for a particular post. So you bend the rules a little bit to get them the position uh, that you want them to be in. Um, this is These kinds of sort of bending of the rules is important when you want a particular person in a particular post, because you think that they are the best person to implement a particular kind of policy or to bring in difficult changes or difficult policy making. And so I'm going to give you just one example of this kind of uh, practice from, from this 2008 to 2018 period of a bureaucrat who rose, uh, who became, who, who had ties to the ruling party from the 1990s, but who rose slowly um, to the top, to the point that he was the most powerful bureaucrat in Pakistan by around 2016. Um, this man is referred to as a firefighter, even amongst his own uh, uh, 
you know, peers. Uh, the reason being that he would be deputed to different departments and tasked with introducing these difficult reform programs and policies that would uh, experience a huge backlash from bureaucrats within those departments, from the ordinary person, from politicians. Um, but the belief amongst the political leadership was that if anyone could implement them, it was him. So he was given the task of, for example, enhancing taxation in the provincial tax department, which he did. He was asked to reduce the government wage bill and served in the general administration department she achieved. Uh, he served in health, he served in communication and works and was tasked with reducing corruption. This was a much more difficult task and there was a huge backlash against his efforts. Uh, people came out on the streets, people went out on strike, uh, politicians criticized him right, left and center to the point where there was a period in the middle where he had to be removed from the post, but he was later brought back, showing the extent to which the political leadership trusted him and backed him up in terms of the decisions that he was making. Next slide. So. The reason that I, you know, earlier didn't mention illegal appointments and I don't include them in the construction of this argument is that they are not very useful for enhancing uh, capacity or performance for the simple reason that they attract the wrong kind of attention. They attack, negative, they attract negative media and opposition scrutiny, which nobody wants when they're trying to enhance capacity or introduce programs. Um, secondly, they can also deepen and exacerbate divisions even within the bureaucracy, either within the department that the person is being illegally appointed to or within the the cohort that they belong to. So the Pakistan Administrative Service, no matter how closely knit, will react if there are illegal appointments being made to the exclusion of some and the prioritizing of others. So uh, next slide. Let me just conclude by saying that we know that subnational variation exists in low capacity countries, but it's not often talked about as far as Pakistan is concerned. So I argue that politicians and bureaucrats rely on professional school and work ties to root transactional relationships, patronage relationships, and achieve particular objectives which involve efficiency and enhancement of bureaucratic performance. However, these gains are usually unsustainable because the person that is put in charge of enhancing performance either doesn't last very long because he can't because it's such a backlash, or the minute that they move to a different department, all of their gains collapse in on themselves as a department does not remain efficient any longer. So I'll stop here and happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Ella Rifaldi um, at IVD, uh, which I will... Um, Ella, do you want to ask your question? So, yes, um, there's... Uh, the, the conventional explanation when you talk about networks in Pakistan are usually family networks. So what is known as Biradri kin groups, uh, those are seen often as the major form um, of associational life. And so actually, you know, when I when I explain to Pakistani audiences that bureaucrats organize differently, it's actually a very unusual finding in that respect that family doesn't matter as much uh, because work connections um, override those kinds of uh, kin group connections. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, competing cohorts, right? So you can have, uh, even within this federal very elite service, you can have conflicts between two different uh, groupings. So just a tidbit from fieldwork, one of the one of those kinds of grouping is um, bureaucrats who like to womanize, bureaucrats who like to drink, bureaucrats who like to, you know, um, play golf, for example. So the, all of those kinds of divisions exist within um, <laughs> even this relatively small elite cadre of bureaucrats. And so when you speak to them and you say, okay, you know, how do you discover like-minded people really? Uh, this is how they do it. Um, and so they have like, you know, the way that everybody else does, they have WhatsApp groups and mailing lists and, and so on and so forth. But a lot of the um, work-related uh, bonding comes from training. Um, training together, working together, working in a supervisory um, and supervisee relationship um, in that way. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, I mean, on that. I mean, are, are the social networks very closely tied to the ways in which civil service <laughs> recruited within Pakistan in the way that things used to be in the UK and then through particular schools, obviously in France, that we see? Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's beginning to change a little bit. So uh, more and more private schools, um, private universities are now um, sending up uh, students to sit the civil service exam. However, uh, the civil service exam pass rate in Pakistan for this particular quarter that I'm talking about is something like 2.5%. 
Um, and so, you know, there's a huge number of people applying and a very small number that actually, that actually gets in. And so even within that small number, if, for example, the private university group happens to be sort of, uh, you know, ganging up together and, and excluding other people, it, it, it's possible that, that will happen in subsequent years as these as as their influence grows. Uh, there are university networks, there are city networks. So whether you're from, uh, you know, which province you're from, which city you're from, those kinds of relationships. So there are as well other presentations in this panel. This is a parliamentary system. So there's no concept of bringing in people from outside. So there's no private sector entrance to serve in any of these bureaucracies unless you are you know, in some kind of advisory or consultant position. So these are all career bureaucrats. And so they are uh, the way that uh, Pakistan system works in terms of politicization. Uh, these people are um, incredibly dependent on politicians uh, for, for their success down the road. Um, and so everybody is quite kind of building up relationships all the way from the street level bureaucrat to the most senior uh, senior level bureaucrat to ensure career stability, um, to, you know, for example, ensure that they don't get transferred somewhere they don't want to live and work. Um, and so there's all these kinds of um, under, the, under the table stuff going on. So I, I think in the UK now you have this conversation with Boris Johnson of, you know, politicization beginning a little bit uh, with, you know, talk about, you know, recently, I think you know, the head of the civil service is about to, is about to resign or, or, is, or is retiring or something like that. And apparently Boris Johnson at some point expressed the view that he was too much of a remainer. So that kind of politicization is very new to the UK, but it's something that's very, very common in Pakistan where, where those kinds of ideas and, and, and whether or not you a politician in the province um, is, is a matter of getting you an appointment. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Samin, on that. There's, a, there's another question for you and then we've got one for you, Joseph, coming up shortly. We also have a couple for Harrison, but we haven't been able to refine Harrison, I'm afraid. So I'll stick with the questions for Samin and Joseph for now. Um, you haven't responded to my request for the spotlight, so I'll just publish your question here. This is from Farwa Sayal, um, and she's asking uh, Samin uh, for her views on that, how the, uh, how it does that, uh, the army and civilian interplay affect um, policy and autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, I mean, if any of you know anything about Pakistan's history, um, we've had a series of interventions where the military has taken over, um, and you know we've had martial law administrators. Each time, uh, what they've done is well, two things. One is that in the early years, post independence, the bureaucracy was very much a partner in these endeavors to destabilize democratic governments. So they actually, you know, took considerable part in that in, in, in the in the process of the coup and in the period following the coup that would support the military government. In uh, more recent years, it's been a slightly more junior relationship. So the bureaucracy has kind of been like a hanger on. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that they weren't very happy when military governments would start making um, appointments within the bureaucracy of military men. So for example, people would move laterally from the military into the bureaucracy. You can't do that as a civilian in Pakistan, but you can do that uh, if you happen to be uh, a military officer. So these kinds of lateral moves obviously meant that, especially during periods of military rule, a lot of this senior posts in the bureaucracy, bureaucracy uh, particularly, for example, in training institutes and other uh, important positions, like, for example, accountability bureaus would go to military men, not to the bureaucracy. And so obviously the bureaucracy at that point kind of, you know, became a little bit disillusioned. Um, this uh, this concept is, is always there that the military might sort of, you know, take over. I think that's, that's something that's always there in any Pakistani's mind. And at the moment, we have a government which claims to be on the same page as the military, um, which has led to uh, the military being involved in a lot of things that you would not think a military should be involved in. So, for example, the military, there's a military guy who advises the prime minister on communications. So, you know, on, on, on those kinds of things, the bureaucracy is, is, is sort of um, wary of military interference in bureaucratic affairs. However, the military is too powerful for the bureaucracy to do anything. It's too powerful for the politicians to do anything either. Um, and so there's not going to be any open revolt or anything. Instead, the bureaucracy is very much playing this game where they will uh, shift allegiances as necessary. Okay, very interesting topic. In, in our studies in Uganda and Rwanda, we also found that the 
not so much the military directly, but the military mindset of the ruling coalition has had a big impact on efforts to impose discipline uh, in certain aspects of the civil service. Um, okay, uh, uh, in, in ways that were quite useful for getting me for menial tasks done, but not very good for encouraging creative uh, <laughs> thinking uh, around their tasks. I'm not surprised. Uh, and we have another one. Um, We've got a very shy audience today. I keep asking people if they want to come up, but no one wants to. So Isaac Samin wants to ask, uh, since mm -hmm. networks undermine efficient implementation, uh, do you think... Oh, sorry, could you pop that up again for me? Oh, yeah. um, uh, would you recommend collaboration between international actors and bureaucrats to enhance... So this is, um, this is really interesting because this is a direction I want to take my research in, um, is to look at how Pakistani bureaucrats deal with DFID or what is now you know, FCDO or FCOD or whatever it is now. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of uh, how they interact and how many, how much capacity building they do of Pakistani bureaucrats who then take early retirement and often join the consulting agency. So in Pakistan, one of the things that I noticed when I was doing my field work was that there were bureaucrats who would go on long leave uh, and start working for various DFID or other uh, you know, USAID or whatever kind of projects. So, for example, there's a there's a different project, SMG, uh, subnational governance. Uh, you would have these bureaucrats taking long leave and working on those consultancy projects instead of you know in the bureaucracy. Um, and so, what one of the things I want to investigate is how often this happens. I don't know yet. I haven't done the field work for that. But um, you know, is there a situation in which working with these kinds of consultants. And there's a lot of work with, for example, the World Bank and DFID, particularly in Punjab. Um, so is this causing a situation of something like brain drain? So is the DIF, is DFID or World Bank or whoever coming in with this idea that, okay, we want to implement this project, we want to do this capacity building. And after they're done, the bureaucrats that they have built capacity with actually jump ship and go and join the consultant. Um, and this is interesting because in some countries, you know, those kinds of connections are very useful to the government. So in places like Japan, this is very much a government policy that they want bureaucrats to leave the service and go and join uh, donor agencies and other private sector organizations so that they can form collaborations with them uh, through the government. Um, but in Pakistan, I don't think there's that much forethought in it. In fact, I think nobody has really thought about the numbers in terms of how many people are, for example, taking early retirement or how many people are going on long leave and what they're doing with their time. Partially, uh, the problem is that there's just not enough data, right? So even if I choose to, or if I want to do this kind of project, I would have to basically go on this massive fishing expedition of trying to get in touch with people who um, might have done something like this. Right, thanks, Samin. We can give you a little rest now. Um, there's some, a couple of questions for you, Joseph. Um, firstly, um, from Michael Adoji at uh, University of um, Cambridge. Who asks the following, do you think that the tactic of shadow ministers by the opposition party would help to boost effectiveness in Ghana? Uh, important question given uh, what happens around election time to public sector jobs uh, in, in Ghana. But over to you and then there's a, a, a further one. Uh, yeah, Michael, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, um, question. Um, you know, my, my answer off the top of my head is I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, you know, essentially, you know, kind of having maybe a shadow minister, someone really keeping tabs on the, on the, on the government minister, I, I mean, I think that could um, help to help to improve the performance of the, of the government minister, perhaps by, you know, always keeping them accountable, always making sure they justify their decisions. But, you know, from what I saw, a lot of what a government minister does, you know, it's not necessarily the most most public, that a lot of these things can happen very much under the table. Um, and even, you know, what I what I noticed, like observing the parliament of Ghana is that, you know, on, on, on one hand, it looks like the, the two major parties are really grappling with each other, you know, on the, in terms of the floor debates. But in practice, they all go back to the same coffee shop at the at, at parliament, that, and they're all like kind of part of very similar, very similar deals. So, so part of me, it's like, yeah, I think, um, from the public side, it, it could be helpful to have sort of a shadow minister system, but um, in reality, I'm not I'm not fully sure how how effective it would be. Okay, um, and the next one for you um, is from uh, Abdullahi uh, Abu Ghafari Abdullahi, um, who is going to come up and ask the question himself. Uh, 
Okay. Can you, can you, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can hear you. Okay. Yeah, Joseph, just two brief, two brief questions. Um, I, I just wanted to find out what your your very brief answer to um the the, the main question you pose would be. Uh, the question of what affects how ministers lead their ministries. I mean, what would be what, what would be your very brief answer to this type of of question? And I also, I also just wanted to know when this study was conducted um when when when, when do we undertake the study yeah so for the for the first question i would say that you know what affects how how a minister leads their ministries you know it's very much the the political pressure they face once they get in there and whether they can effectively lead their ministry and their three-year bureaucrats to accomplish their goals you know so for me like those are two of the key components to you know how they how they can lead and interpret their ministry's mission um, obviously, there, there are more things beyond beyond that. You know, there's the minister's skill, his or her education. Um, but I would say that the two factors of political pressure and uh, the administrative resolve are are the, the key the key answers to that. Um, and as for when specifically I, I did the study, um, so I want to like try to preserve the minister's identity as best I can. So I can I can tell you offline. Um, but but it was um, in the it was in the early 2010s. I would say. Um, but I won't give you an exact date just now. But, um, but we can talk. We can talk later. That's fine. Great. Okay. You, you guys should definitely definitely have a chat. Abdul Ghaffar has been looking at uh, a number of ministries and, and agencies in, in in Ghana, so it'd be good for you to um, put your heads together. Um, let's see. Uh, Bella Rifaldi has another question for you, Joseph. Um, uh, you mentioned there was competition between different ministers. Uh, what role does the president play in mediating uh, this competition? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so I'll say that for the ministers, and one of the ministers in my sample um, basically said that that there was just a lot of this competition from uh, between the ministers to accumulate power, you know, accumulate status. Um, and in a way, it's very lucrative just to just to be a minister, but but many of them want you know a little bit more beyond that. Um, you know, I don't have an answer for what the role of the president is. I have more of an answer for what the role of the president could be. You know, I haven't had the opportunity to sit in on an actual kind of cabinet uh, meeting, but but from the ministers that I I talked with, um, you know, a lot of them had had great respect for the for the president at the at the time and his his ability to um, resolve some of these conflicts uh, between ministers to, to mediate these disputes. And, and a common refrain that I heard from them was that, hey, the president had my back. He supports me. Um, now, that is likely inherent to that particular president at the time. You know, it's not clear. I'm not saying that it's not, doesn't, hasn't continued with subsequent presidents, but um, I think it, it very much depends on the person of, you know, who the president is and his relationship with or his or her relationship with the ministers and the and the parties. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I wonder if it's um, within Ghana, the, each of the ruling parties uh, has has factions within them, uh, which the president needs to balance out when allocating jobs uh, to different key ministers and so on. And work that Abdul Ghaffaru and Giles Moan have been doing in Ghana have, for example, pointed out that one of the dis dysfunctionalities around um, the Ghana National Petroleum corporation at the moment it is around the fact that the i think the ceo of the board is from one faction whereas the chairman of uh, gmbc is from a different faction and uh, it's, it's very difficult to to juggle this or even within the ruling parties in ghana uh, it's very tough um i'm not sure if you want to comment on that and then i'll, I'll bring up naomi Oates to ask her a question yeah i mean i i totally agree um you know and you know my talks with you know the the various ministers, other politicians, like, yeah, the, the factionalism is, is definitely an issue and, and trying to resolve those, especially with the, a lot of the pressure from what I saw came from the regional party chairs. Uh, they, they were particularly powerful um, in, in, in the parties. Um, you know, trying to resolve that is certainly a, a difficult task. Okay, so over to uh, Naomi from the University of Sheffield, whose question is posted there and gets to the heart of a lot of what we've been discussing several panels on this, for this conference. All yours, Naomi? Um, hi there. I think this question could probably go to both uh, speakers, actually. Um, I'm, I'm doing research myself into street-level bureaucrats 
providing water services in Malawi. And I'm quite interested in the interplay between resources and institutional constraints, but then also people's own personalities and agency in, in carrying out their jobs. And I just wondered if you had any reflections of that from your experiences in Ghana and in Pakistan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's an important question. Um, and I would say that, that the personality matters a great deal. Like it's, it's very important. Um, you know, for instance, the, the minister of local government who I followed was, was very much a natural campaigner, like no matter where he went, you know, and, and yeah, it's inherent to the title of being minister, but, but he was the kind of person who can inspire like a lot of confidence between people. And, and this was true even in areas that were not supportive of the NDC, you know, even in the NPP and the opposition, at the time, the opposition areas, you know, he had that certain magnetism to him. Like, you know, he naturally drew people, like he would start a speech by singing a song um, and, and everyone and the whole crowd would just be whipped up into it. So, so yeah, that, that was, that was kind of remarkable, but, you know, in some of the, in one of the other ministries, um, where I, where I was doing this research, a lot of the bureaucrats were, were afraid of the minister. Um, you know, this particular person was, was seen as kind of a, a disciplinarian. And, and I think that that affected the job, but then again, that person, given that they were coordinating between many different, um, entities. You know, it's it's not that this person was personally like bad or a disciplinarian, but that might have been a function of of kind of the uh, of the organization. Um, so, so in reality, it is an interplay between between the two. But I would say that you know personality does does matter a great deal, especially for the bureaucrats for validating the work, helping them to feel valued, and you know carrying through the mission. So, um, it's really interesting question because part of my work was in irrigation and Pakistan, so I maybe have too much to say. Um, but uh, the thing in Pakistan is that the minister mattered very little um, from a policy standpoint. Uh, the minister was there basically to ensure that when he wanted certain kinds of patronage dispensed, the irrigation bureaucracy would hop to it. So for instance, if he and his cronies wanted a little bit of extra water or they wanted uh, you know, a canal to be diverted into their lands, it would just happen. That was the minister's role as far as the irrigation bureaucracy when I did my research was concerned. Um, this was also in, in Pakistani Punjab. Um, however, the person who was the boss was the secretary, the, the bureaucrat in charge of the department. Um, and because this is a colonial era department, there was a lot of pride about how they had they were carrying forward the legacy of British irrigation engineers um, and, and, and the, the, how shall I put this, the, 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 they were educated, that they were somehow above other bureaucrats, right? Because they were classier, essentially. Um, and I found that fascinating because it was, you know, they were, they were sometimes in very bad positions, right? They were, their salary was poor. They didn't get enough allowances. Uh, they were living in difficult conditions. They were working in very difficult conditions. People would be shooting at them. People would beat them up. People, they didn't have places to stay. So they would often have to ride long distances to check on canals. But at the same time, there was this ethos of, you know, we are better than other bureaucrats at a similar level. Um, so you know that that uh, on the bureaucrat side, that personality thing was important. Um, the interesting thing for for you know for me at least was that Punjab is is agricultural heartland as far as Pakistan is concerned. Lots of crop production, food production, but this was not something that the political leadership of the province was interested in. They were not interested in irrigation as a subject. Um, when disaster happens, such as flooding, which happens, there's massive floods about every five years or so in Pakistan, but there's always some level of flooding. Uh, that's when it suddenly becomes important. And at that point, the political leadership suddenly sits up and takes notice and is like, oh, well, why is there flooding? And you know, why has this happened? And why has that happened? And the usual answer for why it has happened is because politicians have encroached on canal uh, overspill areas and constructed, you know, stuff there or, or have grown crops there. And so obviously when the floods hit, everything gets flooded. So the, the only time the political leadership becomes interested in irrigation is either when there is you know this kind of disaster or secondly, when there's a considerable amount of donor pressure to implement certain kinds of policies or initiate uh, some infrastructure project. So uh, I have a paper um, under review, which is about um, the implementation of a program that the World Bank sponsored and essentially enforced on a bunch of countries uh, which have to do with uh, irrigation management transfer. Um, and, and so one of the things that uh, was interesting during that period was that 
the political leadership had to agree to those reforms, even when they didn't want to. They knew, being many of the politicians in Pakistan are landlords, they knew that from a landlord standpoint, it would be a really bad idea to give farmers control of water um, in these areas. But at the same time, uh, they didn't have a choice because the World Bank said, well, if you're not going to do it, then we will take back all of these loans and you'll be bankrupt. So you have to do it. Uh, so there's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ideas in my head and I'm so glad you asked the question. Um, but yeah, that's my, my take on ministers and irrigation and whatnot. Great. Thanks both for that and Naomi for the question. Uh, Naomi, do do please share with us any any publications. Your your work your own work sounds fascinating. So don't be shy in the group text. Do do let us know where to find your uh, uh, your work, please. Um, meanwhile, I will have a question from um, for Joseph from actually from our uh, volunteer uh, who's back backstage helping us make sure that uh, things don't fall apart entirely here. And uh, so Bernard Barner has a question, uh, Joseph. Uh, it's about your methodology, uh, but it speaks also to Naomi's point about personalities and the point from the first plenary at this conference about uh, individual motivations, if you like, the psychic side. Um, and so your method for finding out what drives ministers um, was about, um, um, was based on direct direct approaches you're you're discussing with them and asking them what motivated them. Um, so he wonders if an alternative approach uh, might have yielded something else uh, rather than their um, discourse around being selfless actors. There was some earlier work done by um, Kojo Asante and Richard Crook, which actually followed ministers around and looked at what they did. They had access to them for. Um, whole days and, and weeks in which they could actually see who visited them, who they ended up giving money to, and so on. So there were alternative methods that could be used. Um, uh, so he's interested in that. He's also interested in, in, in nepotism and to what extent that plays a role in uh, appointments. But yeah, so those two things, the method and the type of data you get back, and then the issue of nepotism. Uh, yeah, so for on the um, on the methods question, um, I, I did follow the ministers directly for, for about two or three weeks at a time. So, so yeah, there were some parts like during the slow parts of the day when I would have those direct face-to-face -face interviews. But, you know, I was also there whenever uh, the minister was conducting meetings or was, um, you know, at some kind of rally or, or whatever their, their daily activities were. So, so it wasn't just the, the kind of back and forth discourse, but it was also the observational and the ethnographic part. Um, and I will say that you know, over the course of the two to three weeks I was with each minister, you know, sometimes at the beginning, yeah, they were, they were uptight, they were guarded, you know, they didn't want to like reveal everything. But, you know, over time, as you build the trust, as you build the familiarity, you, you kind of see them loosen up a bit. So, so I would say that much of this paper is kind of based around that, you know, that, that more sort of ethnographic, um, you know, observation, but then also trying to triangulate it with the senior bureaucrats and the close advisors who knew um, each each particular minister. So, uh, yeah. So that that's like more of a fuller description of of the methodology. And um, you know, I didn't want to go on like a purely quantitative route in the sense that it's it's hard to know what's what's quantifiable about you know how a minister you know interacts with the party or leads his or her her ministry. But you know, I thought more of the the soak and poke ethnographic uh, kind of method was was appropriate. Um, so on the question of, of nepotism and to what extent does that does that affect um, appointments? Uh, I don't have a quantitative answer to um, to that, but just you know, kind of obs observationally, um, I would say that at least like you know a couple of the ministers had appointed um, sort of senior folks um, to to their to their inner circle, um, perhaps probably outside of the this traditional civil service means. Um, but you know, from what I saw, like at least most of those people were at the baseline level qualified. You know, they they knew that the particular subject area they were in. So you know, I'm not saying that nepotism you know, doesn't doesn't happen in in appointments, but um, I think it was at least in this example to a lesser degree. Um, now, could this have happened in other ministries? Of of course, but okay. Okay, thanks for that. And um, there's a question from Claire Cummings, uh, which is actually, I think Claire, given how this is doing her PhD on Nigeria, wanted to ask this of Harrison. There's a general question um, about 
or whether uh, POEs only exist at national level or whether we find them at sub-national level um, within each of the two political systems that you've been working on. Uh, so I wonder if each of you could say something about sub-national uh, pockets of effectiveness. Um, mine is definitely subnational. So Punjab is a province within Pakistan. So uh, definitely exists within um, provincial governments. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think in, in the African context, that might, uh, I, I'm not sure if you would refer to subnational levels as province or states. Um, I would further think that probably would exist at district level as well. Uh, Pakistan doesn't have a, hasn't had a consistent local government system, so I can't comment for sure. Um, but when it has had a local government system, there have been these kinds of pockets as well. Um, so absolutely, I mean, I, I, I think you could even potentially look at them. Um, and, I, and I'm, you know, I, I won't speak for for SID, but I think there's research that's done uh, this kind of thing within specific ministries or. Uh, autonomous organizations, semi-autonomous bodies, and so on and so forth. So I, I would think it would be just as relevant. Okay, thanks, Samin. Joseph? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll take this question from, I guess, two, two angles. Um, uh, I'll address the subnational part in the second in the second part of my answer. But for the first part, in terms of like within, say, particular ministries or within particular departments, um, I think um, Aaron McDonald has some research on this in, in Ghana, looking at one particular part of the Ministry of Finance, um, where, where that particular department is, is seen as highly effective, you know, relative to other parts of the uh, Ministry of Finance or other parts of the Ghana bureaucracy. So, so I think in, in parts of the national bureaucracy, then you can certainly see those, those pockets of effectiveness. Now on the subnational, like the regional and the district government levels, um, so by my book on political financing focuses on um, 11 different district governments um, across Ghana, drawn from all, all 10 of the regions. Um, and to be honest, like uh, all 11 of them had, had serious problems in terms of um, providing uh, quality public goods or um, you know, basically a lot of shoddy construction related to issues of corruption and political financing. And, and honestly, I, when I went into the study, I had assumed that there would be variation um, at the at the district level, but but it wasn't particularly there. Um, but I'll, what I'll say is that at each of the district, you know, like there were certainly a lot of bureaucrats who were well qualified, you know, who were um, you know really inspired to to do their work, but you know just ran into a variety of, of political challenges that that hindered them from doing that. Um, so at least at the the district government level, the the local government level of Ghana, you know, back back when I did that study. Um, it wasn't quite apparent that there was um, that there were subnational sorts of pockets of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Well, thanks uh, both for, for dealing uh, with a bit of a heavier load uh, with the Q and A session than normal, given that we uh, we were a presenter down there. And thanks to all the audience for for their questions. We're going to wrap up the session shortly, but it's been great to see that there's a, a flourishing world of research on po uh, pockets of effectiveness going on, adopting very uh, different types of approaches and using different frameworks to understanding what they uh, look at. And I think, Joseph, in particular, your um, two by two uh, would be very helpful for identifying what we should expect from different ministries, uh, depending on their level of political liquidity uh, and the types of roles they undertake, what uh, Michael Roll calls the mandate of such organisations. And uh, with Samin's presentation, one of the things I'll certainly take away is the enduring importance of, of how public sector appointments are made. Um, something which changed only very slowly uh, in the UK system in terms of moving away from a, effectively a class-based system uh, of appointments uh, via uh, certain types of public schools to make sure there was a, a kind of aristocratic bureaucratic caste uh, within the UK, which only slowly got displaced uh, over time and hasn't fully disappeared as yet. Uh, so these are long-term historical challenges for countries uh, across the globe, certainly not just in the global south. And uh, for David and Claire, I think uh, what we keep coming back to in these two sessions is this, the importance of leadership, the interplay of organisational and um, political leadership, uh, but in ways that can only be understood uh, when you place them within 
the configurations of power within which they operate and uh, which determine their room for manoeuvre within. Uh, so we've had this constant interplay running throughout the two sessions. Uh, for those of you who didn't or couldn't join the first session earlier, uh, it was fully recorded and it will be back up online at some point and uh, lots of the materials are published via the ECID uh, website. Um, so thanks to everyone for participating. Um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, there's a, a few sessions going on, including the DSA AGM, where we'll be voting in new councillors, so do come along to that as well. Uh, and yeah, all the best.